So let's get started. Welcome to the BPF microconference. Um, it's great to see so many people here. We have a tight schedule, so many things to talk about, and every slot has roughly 20 minutes. So after that, we would need to make a hard break, depending on how the discussion goes, but um, we would like to cover as much as possible. Um, there are three speaker gifts that we can hand out, and we decided uh, we'll hand out the speaker gifts to those slots that have the best discussions, because this is <laughs> because it's it's about discussion to move things forward, um, yeah, to make progress for them for upstreaming uh, your code and you know, and one more thing, um, there's an Etherpad, so I would like to encourage everyone um, to fill it in. The URL is like. I will update it here. It's like etherpad.net slash, slash p slash lpc2019 underscore, and then there's BPF. So that was from the previous microconference. So it would be great if everybody is helping out, filling in the etherpad. And with that said, I don't want to waste any further time and give this lot to Andre. Thank you. One, two, three. Oh. Hi, uh, my name is Andre. I'm working at Facebook, and today we'll be talking about some of the ongoing uh, and future improvements to uh, BPF developer experience in general. So I'll, I'll start briefly like describing the problem that we are trying to solve. Uh, currently at Facebook, we have quite a lot of applications that use BPF. Usually they are done as a long-running daemons deployed either to the entire fleet or like big portions of the fleet. So the way that development, BPF development is done, it's you write the C code for BPF program, then that C code by some means are embedded into C or C++ usually uh, application as a string, right? So like we have C code in C code as a string. Then that application gets packaged uh, together with libbcc, which embeds Clang LLVM together, and that is deployed to data center. Then in data center, what happens, application starts, it uses its embedded Clang passes to it its embedded BPF C code. Uh, it uses system-provided kernel headers and compiles all that together into an object file demarcated as bpf.o, and that object file is injected into the kernel. So pretty much every single part in that red rectangle is problematic. So first of all, dependency on system kernel, uh, kernel headers. Uh, it's a problem to keep it in sync. It's a problem sometimes to just like deploy it. For example, if you have a custom kernel that you want to test out on a few machines, like you usually won't have in sync kernels and then when kernel headers uh, get out of sync, like you, you just get essentially data corruption like without sometimes knowing that. Uh, second of all, LLVM Clang dependency is heavy both in terms of size and in terms of like startup resource usage. So that causes outages sometimes due to like constrained uh, machines and overall like this also causes the like problematic development cycle where you get BPF compilation errors in runtime just because you compile it in runtime. So we set out to solve this problem and uh, the solution that we propose is BPF core which is compile stands for compile once run everywhere and uh, it consists of few pieces uh, some of them are done some of them are still in progress. So instead of depending on system kernel headers we say that kernel should be self-describing using BTF, and then we can take this BTF and generate C header, which we denote usually VM Linux.h, which contains all the uh, kernel uh, structures and types, including those that are internal to the kernel and not usually exposed through the uh, like kernel headers packages. Then instead of relying on LLVM and Clang in runtime, you will pre-compile BPF program. That's not so simple, so like you also need to record some relocation information to be able to adjust your program to specific kernel that program will be deployed to. And well, of course, like by pre-compiling, you'll, you'll already get like compilation errors and then like more natural uh, compilation cycle, but also dependency on just BTF to validate that like your program is valid is valuable uh, in that like you can pre-validate that your program, at least like the field accesses that you have in your program, will match like the set of kernels that you care about. 
So the first part is more or less done. It's a kernel BTF. Uh, you can enable it today with config debugging for BTF. Uh, you need a pretty recent pahole, 1.13 or uh, newer. What you will get is BTF information, which is deduplicated, which is small, which is embedded into the kernel image. You can get it from SysFS with like sys kernel BTF VM Linux. You can see that it's roughly 2.2 megabytes, depending on the configuration of your kernel. Uh, as I said, it encodes all the types, so you can use BPF tool to dump like one relatively big header with all the types, which you can just include into your BPF uh, program without any other system kernel header. And uh, it will just compile. It will have task extract, skbuff, whatever you need. Like, it's not ideal. There are some problems like macros, right? Like BTF, BTF and like dwarf to some extent doesn't encode uh, defined, so some macros won't be available, of course. So that's a problem which we need to solve somehow. Uh, the part that's also done was like field. So essentially beyond BTF, uh, BPF core consists of two parts. First one is relocating fields because the problem is that like when you do introspection of the kernel structures, uh, the you will refer to field by name, but like the actual memory layout changes between different kernel versions and kernel configurations. So you cannot really know the offset beforehand. So we will record uh, like intent essentially, field relocation, where we will record like which type and which field you want to access. And then like libbpf will use, again, kernel BTF on the target machine and the recorded, re recorded relocation to adjust your program just, just right so that like you will load the correct pieces of memory using usually BPF Pro Grid. Uh, so the part that's not done and is kind of up to discussion is the conditional relocation. So if you look at the previous example, uh, we read IO, AC, read bytes, right? And the problem is that like some kernels that are not compiled with config IO task accounting won't have this struct at all, right? So it's impossible to relocate. So if you want to build a BPF program and compile it once and run it on kernels that both have IO accounting and not, you will need to do some more. And like what we propose is to support extern variables. Uh, like some of those will be provided by libppf, so like config uh, keys, uh, Linux version, and stuff like that. And then in your code, you will just use your normal C logic. Like if something is enabled, then you can try to access field. Otherwise, you have to have some fallback. Uh, like, and there are, the thing that's up to discussion is like two ways to implement this. Yonkon already impl implemented uh, experimental support in Clank. Uh, the way that you do it, you put the extern uh, variable declara declaration in a special section, and Clang will recognize that and rewrite your instructions in such a way that the instruction that actually try to load the value of the extern variable will get it as an embedded uh, instruction. So it's easy for libbpf to just replace that like embedded constant into like the actual value once we load it on the target machine. The problem with that is that it only supports up to eight byte accesses, of course, because we don't have the instruction that has more than eight byte immediate constant. So we are researching the possibility of supporting this more generically, where you can extern any type and uh, still have the same behavior, where like if some conditions don't apply, you won't even run the code and verifier will actually recognize that and will not produce an error or anything like that. The problem with that is that the instructions generated are more complicated. As you can see on the right side, you will get like first the address of the, like, in this case, my struct, right? Like R1 will get my struct address, which typically will be some uh, internal map similar to global, like similar how we do this with global data. And then it will dereference that pointer with some of that potentially to get the actual value of the field inside the struct. So to support that, uh, well, first of all, like the idea is that we can get libbpf essentially can gather all those externs that like it it recognizes uh, either as like provided by libbpf or provided by the user space. It can construct the, another special internal map similar to global data, but make it read only for both uh, user space and kernel space. So like it just like initialized once and never used. And then we will have to teach verifier to recognize pointers to that map so that like it can track the constants essentially throughout the flow of the program. With that, hopefully, like you'll be able to just say like, oh, if some condition doesn't apply, just like never try to re uh, allocate, like read some field which doesn't exist on this kernel, and uh, it won't even matter like what offset was there because we will never run this code. Anyone has any questions, objections? Sure. Hey, 
Um, I don't think it's on. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Um, in my C code, how would I check that a given structure has a field? So you cannot check like that some kernel struct has the field. Well, at least like we don't have a way to do this. So this will be either based on Linux kernel uh, version check, because you just know that some versions don't have it, or based on config, as I showed in the example, or it can be provided by user space, like in this case, right? Like the my struct can be like anything. So you can have like different flags, like run this feature, run that feature, depending on what user space knows about the environment. So like even if it's some very complicated condition, you can just like check it and just send it to your uh, program. I, I think it would be very nice to have some sort of read this field from a structure, and if it doesn't exist, just get some default value, like zero. Uh, maybe we need to think about like whether it's possible to support like in a kind of standard C way, but. Uh, I'm not sure. Like, I need to think about this. It, it might be possible with BTF, but I need to think about details. Uh, what, what, what do you think the d good default value is? I think you would specify it when you're reading the field. The parameter. Just like when you read from a map, if something's not present, you can get a default value, usually. You could ask if the, if the struct has a field of that type. Yeah, so we were thinking about extending Clang uh, to provide sort of like C++ uh, prone type type information sort of analysis where you can actually query whether this type equal to type, but it's in the category of extending C language, uh, which will okay. get tricky, tricky to upstream. It's, it's restricted expanded C. Possible, I guess. Yeah, which is why I said, like, with standard C, I'm not sure, like, if we can do it. But you should but think about yeah, this. Yeah. Good ideas. Thanks. Yeah. It, it looked like you already had a bit of a macro accessor to read it, something. Well, so the macro that I used in this example just like abstracts this long built-in preserve access index. It doesn't do like much. It's just like BPF appropriate. Because I was yeah. thinking you just got just add like comma zero to that macro. It's like read this field if it doesn't exist, return zero. Not so simple. Okay. Universe is like a valid value or all values. All valid integers can be valid. Not valid value. Value. It you can do it, you can do it twice and if you get a different value. <laughs> and also think about this, like the I'm value saying, we we so, had this problem when dealing with uh, automatic detection of syscall errors with error nodes and stuff, because there are some uh, system calls that return something in the entire universe of long, the value of long, and therefore we needed the a processor car uh, carry condition in order to indicate error or not, because all bits are valid. Mm -hmm. So one more thing to this, right? Like the value that, like this default value, it's not necessarily an integer or something like that. BPF probe read can read like arbitrary piece of memory. So how would you specify the default? It's like it becomes complicated, right? So if you read like an integer field, sure. If you read like some variable sized array. Like yeah, so maybe for, for, for more unusual fields, you would need some sort of if field exists explicit condition. But I think a lot of cases would be handled yeah. with just a return zero return So just one, uh, one more comment. So this uh, built-in for preserve access index is an offset. It's not the actual load. It's only the offsets. It's only adjusting like constant from five into six. There is no default value there. Maybe you could always return zero, and then if the offset is zero, you know it doesn't exist. I don't know. Well, BPF Pro read always fills everything with zero if you provide invalid pointer, so I don't know. Anyway, but, uh, I, think, I think we need to like, table this discussion and like, follow <laughs> up after, because. Yeah, we have some more stuff. <laughs> Any other questions before we move? No? OK. Uh, so, but beyond core, there are things that like we can and should probably improve to make the life of the BPF developers, uh, BPF application developers easier. And like, we probably won't go through all of them, but let's let's start with BPF defined maps. So, if, for people that like watched the BPF development recently, they know that like we recently added a simple way, like simple alternative way to define BPF maps in a de purely declarative way, uh, which is heavily relying on BTF information. Uh, and this can be extended further to handle more complicated cases still in a pretty nice and understandable way. So just to give you an example, on the left is like how you would do BPF map definition before 
like you, you would like have the BPF map DAF, you will fill few fields, key size, value size, and all this stuff. And if you want to also capture the type information, you will have to do the separate BPF annotate KV pair uh, macro where you will have to match the map, my map name with this, an integer with struct, and so on. And if you get like it wrong or it gets out of sync, nothing will crash, nothing will cause co compilation error, it will just not work. Like the, the type information won't, uh, won't work. So the, the way that we recently added is on the right, right? We use a very simple uint and type macrosys. They're like one-liners, essentially just like hiding the pointer to a type where you say that it's a, essentially the map is a set of key value pairs. Type is hash, max entries will be one. The interesting part is type key and type value. Here you specify that the key is of type integer, which automatically means that the key is of uh, four byte size. And it will never get out of sync. Similar for the value where you provide some like custom my value, right? And then you just put it into dot maps uh, section. So it's shorter, it captures type information, and it's harder to get it wrong. But what about the more complicated map in map case, for example? Right now, libpf doesn't allow you to do it declaratively. You will have to do it in code with quite a lot of boilerplate. Uh, IP route 2 has its own slightly different format. And the way that they do it is through few extra fields that their BPF map definition struct has. In this case, it's ID, inner ID, and inner index. And ID and inner ID on inner and outer map should match and the inner index uh, specifies like which slot this map is put into. So let's think about like how similar stuff can be done with like BTF defined maps. What about like if we define the struct that defines the inner map definition, which looks exactly the same like as a normal map. And for the outer map, it also looks exactly the same like a map, except that you have a array of values of type where type is actually this inner map because that's what map in map is right it's a collection of other maps and the, the the extra thing is that like you actually have to initialize it right to be useful so you will just refer to it by a pointer like a normal c code internally that will be like some elf uh, uh, relocations and libpf will do some post-processing all this stuff but this should work at least it compiles i tested uh, just, just to show like why IP route ways is, is not desirable is that like once you add more than one inner map, like you start to, to keep like duplicating fields that have to be kept in sync and it just becomes uh, like nightmare to maintain. While with uh, the BTF defined way, you would just like add another map and a pointer to it, which will be pretty nice. Uh, the, the other like complicated case is proc array where you want to fill in like separate programs into a slot of proc array and then do tail call. Right now, the IP route 2 also allows it by having the convention where you have an ID and then like the section name is ID slash the slot uh, and, and stuff like that. And we can do similar stuff as to map, map in map where we just use essentially a pointer to a function which feels pretty natural. And you, you also say that like the values is the array of function prototypes uh, and you just fill in the pointers. And like with the newer C syntax for uh, array initialization, you can even like do holes, right? You can say like zero equals that and then 10 equals that and like not specify the two through nine. So what do you think about that? So, so this works well if your uh, functions are always static and, you're, and it's all defined in your code, but what if the um, tail call you want to jump to is dynamic? Well, you will still be able to do everything programmatically, it's right? It's right. just like declarative, like common cases should yeah. be easier because right now the map in map and like proc array is, is kind of cumbersome to, to initialize. And also like one, one benefit of the latter, uh, latter use case is that like if you want to reuse the same sub program in two different proc arrays, you can do it with the BTF defined way while you, I assume you cannot do it with the section name convention that we have right now in IP route too. Is it right? Probably, right? Um, I think the approach should also work uh, like in the case of Cilium, like those IDs, they are actually um, constants that are emitted from an orchestration system so that you basically fill this in dynamically. But it should also work like if we would define this as a macro, those uh, actual um, 
initializations. I'm not fully sure yet, but I mean, yeah, so the, the, so the question is like, how would the orchestration system put this uh, information in there dynamically? I mean, like from, from. Um, well, both ways are declarative, right? So like it just amount, like it's a question of how to generate, oh, like in this case you generate ID, which is just, yeah, embedded, so and in this case you have the actual code that you yeah. have to run. Yeah, we, I mean, we have to think about this and play with the serum code a little bit. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we have, would have to figure it out on the way. <laughs> I'm not fully sure yet. Like, like it's a it's a common well, not so much program, but like the mapping map is a very common complaint from from people who had to use it like programmatically with libp yeah. So we. I mean, the mapping map case that. should be. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So then the question also becomes: uh, We've already discussed this in the list, but backwatch compatibility with IPRAT too. And I think your idea was libbpf can detect whether or not the BTF stuff is there and then expose a hook to, for example, IP mm -hmm. Route 2 if we port that to use bpf and then it yeah. can do its own Yeah, thing. so when I initially implemented the BTF to find maps, I wanted to just ignore unknown fields and let like user application, if they want to process it, uh, we voted to be like more strict, but like we can relax it, right? Like with some option, you can say like, if you don't recognize it, like take known fields, but I think you want to take it a, a little bit further and just like not let libpf process the BTF and instead just like call some callback or let user do it. Am I right? No, not necessarily. I think like if the BTF is there, mm -hmm. that means you're already using, I assume that means you're already using the new format. So we don't need like, so that's fine. Just let libpf do its thing and load the whole thing. Okay. But if there's, n but if it's not there, and we're loading an old program that's been compiled without BTF information, or like, and it's using the IP Route 2 format, IP Route 2 needs to be able to hook in and say, I still want to use the libbpf functions to load the whole thing, mm -hmm. but then I want to be able to go in and programmatically fill in the structures um, with the map and map information mm -hmm. and the pinning and everything, yeah. and then. So continue if I'm correct, IPPF. right now the API like of the libpf is split into two parts, like opening, well, three actually, opening, loading, and attaching, right? So between you open and load, you can actually create maps, right? So like you, you should be able to do like your custom map loading, just create it programmatically, right? You, you load it from your ELF, you create it programmatically, you put it into BPF object, and then you can continue with load. There's Would that work? There's also, there's also already a flag to ignore a non field. There is? Ah, okay. Oh, that is? Cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah because, well, I, it's also just, I don't want to re-implement the whole map thing. I want to reuse as much from libbpf as I can. Like, but if it's, sure, a, you can just, like, do if it's incompatible for map, like, you cannot really reuse much, right? No, you can use, you can reuse, like, you can reuse everything up to the map and map stuff. Up to the map and map, I see. Like, if it, if, so it's partially compatible. In many compatible. cases, we don't have a map and map. We just want to use the loader to get all the other stuff. We should, we should probably talk yeah, about we'll, that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're probably out of time. OK. Well, that's for next time. Thank you. Hello? Oh yeah, good. So uh, today I will talk about the BPF debugging and uh, 
uh, in user space, and we have GDB, we have LLDB, we have many other different debuggers. But typical BPF debugging is not a lot of people touched, and uh, we just try BPF print the key, uh, trace print the key. So let's see what we can do better. Just give me a second here. And uh, first, let me introduce a couple, uh, one use case. And uh, this is the load balancer uh, self-test program, uh, test uh, uh, L4, uh, LB. And uh, a bunch of program here is a process packet, is a, a call function. And you get a packet, and then you test whether it's uh, IPv4 or IPv6. And then you extract some information, and then you set the tunnel key. And uh, you try to say later on, I will try to do a load balancer work. And, uh, but you may find a problem like, uh, okay, some of the IP address is not set up in the tunnel key and is not tunneled, so what's going on? And uh, let's see how do we proceed from here and whether we can discover problems. And uh, you may get some hypothesis, say, okay, and uh, maybe some map lookup and uh, didn't get the value back. And uh, so, and uh, I want to say check at particular line 431 and uh, line 445 and to see uh, for my particular address whether uh, this map lookup failed and that's the reason. So you get this hypothesis and you want to verify that. Ver verify that. And uh, so the action will be okay, typically in user space if you have this one you will say I want to have a breakpoint and at these two lines with this condition. And uh, well, let's see how BPF can do that. And uh, another thing is, suppose you verified, okay, at particular line, line 445, and it's missing, or oh, it's a mystery. Why is it missing? I don't understand. And so I want to print the map, and I also want to print this key, and to see whether I make any mistake or not. So in summary, uh, what we want to do is, uh, we want to break at the two points, and also at the particular points, if it happens, or in the other points, you could print the different things. You want to print uh, some key and uh, print a map. So in user space, you can just have a bring point here, and then you have some conditions, and then you just dump a uh, GDB. You can do that. But in BPF case of today, typically, and the people will try to rewrite the program, add a BPF print K or something, and uh, try to, with this condition, if this condition true, I will print this key. And you may not be able to print the whole map. You will print some of them it's at most. And so you need modified kernels and coordination. It's pretty complex. And uh, how do we in, uh, do it in BPF? And uh, think about this. I have a simple idea. And uh, let's see how it works or not. So uh, I, I, I will try to do, let's see, uh, still use a BPF tool and uh, invent a new command for the program, inspect. So the idea is, and from a high level user perspective, you specify a location, you specify action, and you spy, specify conditions. And uh, you may want to have several, in, uh, basically inspect the spec together. The reason is you want to collectively collectively uh, get more information and uh, for this particular issue because they are correlated. So we have a location and uh, like a function name plus offset and have action. You can skip something or you can print some expression. You can print some registers or print some memory edge buffer, some contents. And the condition, you just condition or it's even can be a watch point. It may or may not work, I just write it. So, and, uh, and uh, uh, let's first uh, just debugging typical JTID assembly, that's most common. So let's uh, don't do this, uh, I mean, non JTID interpreter because hopefully people use that and uh, they may have some other ways, I don't know. And uh, so the current approach like this, function name offset, this is uh, uh, like uh, assembly level but I think later on, once we get better BTF support, we already have some kind of a support, but sometimes in the line number, file name, this need to be really checked, verified before we really uh, can do it at the source level. 
So how, any question about just uh, this interface? <laughs> uh, have you looked into uh, RGDB, remote GDB, whether that could be an option for debugging uh, BPF in the kernel? Uh, yes, remote GDB could. And uh, the thing is, uh, remote GDB as an interface is uh, possible. And uh, the thing we do here is whether we can leverage BPF2 infrastructure or not. Because it's a user space, remote GDB also is another way we could support if there's enough interest or things like that. Because they are all user space, we can do that, yes. And uh, if no questions, okay, let's go to how we do in the kernel to support this. Before that, let's have a more concrete example, try to debug my own problems. Okay, so suppose the program ID is 14. So here you will try to inspect the program ID 14 and the location is the process packet to 30. And uh, on the right hand side, I have this uh, uh, BPF or bytecode. Uh, remember, just, just, just to remember here, uh, sometimes I'm myself confused. Is this 230 actually is uh, 255 minus 25. Uh, the reason we do this is just because of simplicity and for JIT. And uh, because later on, JIT may have, uh, JIT is like a, a each function has its own memory regions. But this can change spec. And uh, action is a print first one, print hit one. Just, just, you just hit it, so you know the problem here. And you have a condition. Condition is like this, register equal to zero. And uh, because, well, it's a, is if R1 equal to zero, you go to exit. So that's a problem here. And because go to some other places, they miss the lookup. So you have this one, and then you want to print have another condition, like your IPv6, you have a, a 128 bit, so you participate into two places, like from the R9 plus zero, okay, this address equal to this one, and uh, another um, 64 bit equal to another one. If this hit and print this one, this could be one spec and uh, try to debug this problem. And uh, another way, uh, another one is uh, suppose this indeed hit, you want to print the key and also the, basically the map itself. And the command line is like uh, you print this memory region and also print the map name. So on the line we will try to make it work. And I mentioned earlier source annotated code may work in the future, but right now we just focus on the, uh, no, the source annotated codes and on the right hand side, like the uh, static or this if condition, it will help you find which code to look and which register to use and which memory buffer you try to use to comparison. Yeah, so, and uh, I think the next one is like a kernel support. There's uh, maybe some suggestions here and uh, in order to do that, I'm thinking about, well, and uh, we try to use a BPF to debug a BPF. And uh, user can have some conditions, actions, and for each inspect, and so we will just create a BPF program based on your spec, and uh, attach this BPF program to this particular JIT instruction. And, uh, and this BPF program will share the maps, globals, in read-only mode, of course, you don't want to change the original program, and uh, with the to be debugged BPF program, and uh, the context is the BPF uh, kprop. So it got a register. It is supposed to get the uh, JIT, uh, basically architecture, all the registers from there, and <coughs> you will be able to, if JIT actually has a BPF bytecode has a reasonable correlation, you will be able to go to back bytecode and uh, try to correlate with your conditions. So for kernel support, so we need a nested kprop. And uh, currently, actually, we do not allow that in two different places. One is a, a kprop infrastructure itself does not 
like the nested K-probe, and the BPF infrastructure doesn't like it either. Currently, we have a, a active program counter, and it at most one, so that means we don't support that nested. And uh, also, we need uh, some kind of infrastructure change and uh, to permit uh, trace K-probe BPF jitted instruction because it is mostly allocated in the module uh, address range. So currently we have some restrictions. BPF itself is not really a module. So currently it gets rejected and uh, some other cases and uh, architecture backend may need some kind of the tweaks to make it work. So ultimate goal at this point, at the initial stage, we, we will be debugging BPF at the assembly level and uh, try to help people and uh, try to, uh, you know, to re rewrite your program with the trace print K or other stuff. And uh, yeah, this will have a little bit of work and uh, on the developers because they need to look at this uh, instructions, bytecode, and uh, try to figure out what's the condition and what they really want to do. But hopefully we will evolve from there. So any questions? So uh, is it correct that like it assumes that you can easily reproduce the bug and you can run like multiple times, right? And just like try to like narrow down the, the problem, right? Uh, I don't know that case by case. <laughs> so well, for some programs you could try and get something and further narrow down. And if bug appear more than once or repeatedly for some bug, if they just appear once, yeah, well, this may not be a right approach. So, so another question, like, I'm just curious, like, you, you, you listed like those nested K probe and all those problems, right? Yeah. Would it be easier like if you can just switch out the jitted program into an interpreted mo program, but, but exactly the same program, right? And uh -huh. then like teach uh, BPF in kernel environment to record additional information that we want, right? Would that simplify this implementation? That uh, will simplify the kernel support and uh, we will still use the BPF program, but we don't have this nested uh, BPF problems. And uh, you, the thing is, yeah, this, this could be another choice. Let's put this away. Yes. So like I was thinking about, you know, like yeah. there is this re re record and replay, uh, mm -hmm. like add-on to GDB, right? Yeah. Where it actually records like all the important waypoints in the program and then yes. let you play it back. So like with yes. non-jitted, but like interpreted uh, BPF code. And uh, some program won't have an interpreted program because we have a JIT always on and uh, I don't know whether we want to hack to bring it back just for this or not. Okay. And but yeah, it's it's possible. And uh, for for that case, and we potentially could add some hooks in the uh, interpreter, and uh, things will be a little bit easier. Okay. And for, from infrastructure perspective. Um, so yesterday, I think there was a talk about you know kind of. XTP and integrating XTP programs with TCP dump and would be great to be able to see what the XTP does. Would it be possible to use this to essentially say tell TCP dump, kind of dump the packet at the start of this XTP program and then dump it at the end of the XTP program together with metadata or do you think that would have to be another mechanism? Yeah, this uh, can be done and uh, so basically we write a BPI programs and in the beginning of this one, and uh, basically the K probe, it just returns. So yeah, this can be abused in that way. <laughs> Extended, I would say. <laughs> so I kind of think that there's two modes of debugging when looking at BPF programs. There is the live debugging where you want the BPF programs to execute and trigger these K probe things and give you the yeah. information because you're not really sure in what scenario the problem exists, right? Yeah. So you have to run yeah. and yes. let it go and trigger. Yes. You have other cases where you're starting to develop a new program and you have a packet piece yes. of data yes. and you want to step through your program yes. and see what's wrong. And there, that's why we need some user space BPF thing where you can step through it with a GDB-like interface or whatever, yes. it doesn't matter, and yes. attach this piece of data like the SKB that gets yes. captured uh -huh. to, de to debug simple initial program problems yes. versus yes. sophisticated yes active deployed pro uh, program problems. Yes. We're solving two different problem spaces yes. right here. Yes, that problem is in next slides and uh, basically single steps a lot. <laughs> so uh, 
So w um, one more question on, on yes, that. Um, are there also any plans to integrate this into, for example, I think Dragon it's called, right? Uh, you yes, as well? Dragon, Dragon. Can, so this so can you can like dump the whole stack and yes. register state and everything. Yes, I think this, might uh, be yeah, Dragon is also user space and uh, this can be done in Dragon. And a single step, so this is actually pretty hard and we could use Kimu and uh, if you use Kimu and then we can use GDB. GDB would de de debug Kimu and then you can get the address and then you may really single step and uh, do something. Another, another thing, of course, we want to see whether we can have a, a sleepable BPF program, which is a much harder thing to attack. But currently we have, I, I don't know, and we have runtime, real, real time is merged to the main line, and whether BPF will be able to basically preemptable or not, maybe. If it is preemptable, maybe have something to be done, whether we could piggyback on that and uh, do some single step. That's just some wise thinking. Yeah, not sure yet. I mean, I mean, it's really interesting to think about having a user space BPF execution environment, like a full execution environment uh -huh. where you can provide a buffer and an example program and step yeah. through it. Like, you don't need QMU, you don't need any special things. Maybe even built into the GDB backend for BPF because it has reversible execution support. It already uh -huh. has a mechanism where you can describe how instructions behave. So yeah. we, and there's a simulator inside GDB. So we could like think yes. about doing something the like that. The only problem is helpers. So yes, helpers. What do you do with helpers? <laughs> you would have to have a simulation <laughs> that, library. Yeah, that's the only problem, helpers. Would it make any sense to expand the actions instead of saying print or whatever? You just say, call my BPF program to perform all these actions and have all the access to the helpers that you way. You mean for the, next, this, for the next instruction? Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 it's doable, I mean, yeah. And, uh, so BPF trace points in BPF programs. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> we, we, like we. a packet point of view. <laughs> the packet comes in, it's the trace point called this BPF program that puts all we, the packet we, we, information yeah. in this user space preferred way to go to user space. Problem solved, we have our meta trace point. Yeah, I mean, theoretically it's a BPL program and we can have a program ID and just you just send it, it can kill code, it can do anything, theoretically. I, I have a short question. Did you ever see a need for a single stepping support? I mean, like, when you had to debug a BPF issue and you would say, oh, this would have solved it? Uh, I'm not an active, really, BPF developer for real use case, and our audience here probably have an opinion. I think, I think the people who would find it useful would get discouraged with BPF before they would tell us that there's, this is a necessary feature. So we should take that into consideration. OK. Question? I think one thing about single stepping, though, is that since all BPF programs are kind of, we've kind of almost solved the halting problem, maybe we can just record, as someone was suggesting, all the state, you tra actually a full, trace. a full trace, and then you don't need to single step so much because it's kind of bounded yeah. information you could record. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure we need single stepping support, but being able to kind of build a custom SKB to throw at a BPF program and then oh, kind of... That could be extended, I guess, yeah. But that would is, be is there a way to call that from users? It's really hard to simulate, like, you know, trace instruction. Yeah, it's really hard to simulate, like, you know, trace instruction. So I don't know if we can generically, like, do that, because, like, when you do tracing, right, you cannot just simulate all internal kernel state, and, like, your bug can be dependent on kernel state or, like, inputs of the packet. So, you know, like, it, sometimes you have to debug live program with live input. So like recording and then like maybe replaying back would be more generic. So uh, I would only comment uh, here that I, uh, I think we're like in this discussion we're I think over focusing on the solution, whereas I think the main focus here is to uh, show that uh, today uh, debugging all BPF programs is a is a pain point, and we're trying to simplify it as much as possible through whatever solution it is. Whether it will extend test run with single step in like extra tracing to do in user space, uh, attaching GB, like we're considering all options open. Uh, 
mainly to make the debugging easier. So that's what it is about. And this is just so far the uh, ideas that seems the easiest to tackle first. Um, to what is worth, we are actually adding support to the CNU simulator for a BPF uh, simulator. Uh, of course, the kernel, the kernel helpers are sort of a problem there because what do you make them to actually return or what to do with the arguments? But uh, we will basically try for it to be possible to at least attach to GDB to run the simulator, to run your program, and then at the minimum, you know, to be able to debug somehow, you know, like logical problems with conditionals, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, okay. I think we probably need to table it. But uh, just, okay. just a very quick comment. There were like at least two or three simulators already written in the simulating the user space, uh, user space BPF interpreters. Uh, and well, the main problem is to set all of the helpers. Like because yeah. calling into the kernel helpers, you cannot really simulate any of this from user yeah, space, right. which is main part of the BPF program logic. Hmm. We will try. I mean, we, we are interested in investigating and researching a bit to what extent it is possible to emulate kernel contexts, you know, in user space. And the simulator in the GNU toolchain, you know, is part of the toolchain, so sort of comes for free, right? If you use CGENDAS with it, you know, in Binutil, so we lose nothing, basically. This also includes the GDB support, by the way. Oh, yeah, I was just wondering, um, I don't know if it would be useful to anyone else, but I think more than single stepping, I'd love to have a way of taking a core dump of a BPF program. So, you know, I get my SKB data, and then I can take a look at that and look at what the register state is. So I think, I don't know, for me, you know, having like a BPF assert helper or something like that, and if that assertion gets tripped, then we get our core dump of what our program state is. I think something like that might be useful as well. The before and after. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Okay, maybe we will think about that. <laughs> Today is not allowed. Safety first. Thank you. Yeah. So Thank next you. one. Everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Joe, are you ready? Just about. Cool. Right. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. My name is Lawrence. I work for. Test, test. Test, test. For a third time, lucky, I hope. My name is Lawrence. I work for Cloudflare. And this is Joe works for, or on the Cilium project, I should say. And uh, for the next 10 or so minutes, we'll talk about um, our topic of writing uh, a pure Go eBPF library. A little bit of introduction. Um, both Cilium and Cloudflare use uh, eBPF very heavily. We do, at Cloudflare, we use a lot of uh, XDP. We're starting to use TC, and Cilium is a very heavy user of kind of the TC hook. Um, the general way that we use EPPF is that we have a long-running service that is written in Go that ends up managing the lifetime um, and <laughs> finally. <laughs> I have something to hold on to, this is good. Um, which manages the lifetime of our eBPF program. So in, you know, again, Cloudflare case, that's like a, a DOS mitigation system plus a uh, layer for load balancer. And then uh, for Cilium, it is a container security um, system for Kubernetes. Um, looking at the available ecosystem um, right now, there's kind of two containers, I guess, if you were to start um, investigating what could you use to, to build your service. The first one, obviously, is libbpf, which is kind of the canonical implementation. It lives in the kernel. It's written in C. Um, and the other one is called uh, libbcc, oh, this is better, um, which is focused on tracing, I would say. Um, and it wraps uh, lib BPF and depends on LLVM. So libbcc to start off with has a fairly heavy runtime, which has been mentioned. Um, there's this LLVM dependency, um, which makes it fairly difficult uh, to build and package. At least that's what I found in my personal 
kind of uh, experience. Um, there is a Go wrapper that you can use, which is called IOVisor Go PPF, uh, and that uses CGO to call into libpcc. Uh, libppf, of course, is where all of the new features land, where the good stuff is. Um, has relatively few external dependencies. It's also pretty lightweight, but there is no fully fledged Go wrapper. Um, now, I think I need to make a little detour um, and talk about the pure Go syndrome, because this is like a common occurrence that there's an established library out there, and then the Go people go out and rewrite it in Go and don't end up using the common library. And I think that often kind of uh, ruffles some feathers. Um, and I want to give some context why that happens. And I think why, in a way, it's, um, it's encouraged by the ecosystem and it's hard to avoid. Problems with CGO. Kind of the headline thing is that um, compared to just regular Go calls, a CGO function call is relatively expensive. So for kind of a very simple use case like a map lookup, um, in the current implementation, we probably end up paying, you know, 10% more uh, CPU time to just do a, a lookup. And really, the developer experience when using CGO isn't very good. Um, there's a problem of um, if you want to call out to C somewhere that C has to be, you know, kind of built and, and bundled, um, you could link to the library dynamically if you want to, but then we need to solve the packaging problem, which isn't there yet. Um, there needs to be a stable ABI so we can kind of upgrade, downgrade libraries, etc. Um, we could also just kind of take the BPF if we wanted to and copy it into our Go source, but I'm not sure how much we really solve with that. And also pose other problems because we probably end up needing to replace the build system and it's fairly invasive. But really what I think is the crucial point is that using CGO makes the default tooling that Go provides less useful. And I think that's a very strong draw, um, the whole Go ecosystem, which is that you get kind of integrated um, cross compilation you get very good tools for debugging, um, profiling, and tracing. Um, once you start using CGO, that goes away. So, uh, Mike, come sure. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, so uh, you, you probably guessed where this was going. Um, uh, basically, uh, so what we're looking at is writing a, a BPF library um, similar to the BPF, but in pure Go. Uh, to avoid this, the sorts of problems that Lorenz uh, described. Um, so we want to be able to write services that manage eBPF in terms of loading the programs into the kernel, uh, modifying maps, doing all of that, that sort of thing, um, you know, collecting metrics from your data path, manipulating the, the um, data path uh, forwarding behavior, perhaps. Um, and the, we want to write this in MIT so that basically anybody can, can use this library. Uh, so the primary uh, goals are to cover networking use cases. Um, so both Cloudflare and, uh, and also Cilium, we've uh, written Go code to handle our uh, interactions with BPF. Um, and we figure that it's, it's much better to um, uh, manage, this, ma manage the, the interactions with the, um, with the kernel in a single library rather than uh, each maintaining our own separate uh, library. Uh, so we want to maintain minimal external dependencies. Um, so again, this just makes it easier for any project to pick it up and use it. Uh, you don't have you know, some logger or some um, uh, Netlink library there that, that you need to pull in and um, cause problems with that. Uh, so we want to make sure that it's, it's highly tested, uh, you know, using the standard Golang unit testing frameworks um, and highly testable. Uh, so one of the things that we've had some pain with in Cilium actually is um, being able to mock out the BPF layer so that we can test the internal logic of how we process events and generate map entries. Um, and so we'd like to be able to provide some facility there which uh, application writers who write code that interacts with BPF can also use these mocks to mock out BPF and test their own logic. Um, and at the core is really like solving the common problem. So we, we, all, we both have experience with writing some um, Go libraries now we want to uh, solve those, the, the common problems in a central library and make that library composable so that if you need some special extra logic that doesn't really make sense for anyone else, then you can compose that you know, map structure, for instance, into your own struct and then add your own um, functionality on top of that. Uh, so non-goals, uh, so we're not targeting tracing at this point. 
uh, libbcc provides uh, a bunch of this. Um, it's just not a, not a goal for, for our use cases. Um, and uh, th with the kind of composability idea, um, we won't necessarily in introduce support for all hook points. Um, you know, maybe there's some extra, um, either we could provide that functionality in a separate library or, or library writers could, uh, sorry, application writers could have that uh, for themselves. Uh, so steps for getting this up and running. Um, so initially we want to target just maps and uh, programs. So maps, creating maps, deleting maps, um, uh, create, read, update, delete of entries in maps, um, pinning of those maps to the file system, and uh, supporting nested maps per CPU, uh, for programs, being able to create the programs, pinning the programs, attaching them to, um, to TC. And will you support reusing maps? Uh, so the question is, will you support reusing maps? Yeah, so, reusing maps. So yeah. you, you loaded the program, it created a map, and then you load another program which wants to use, use the, the same map. Yes, absolutely. So um, for instance, in Cilium case, uh, when we do an upgrade, what we do is, then the first time Cilium will start up, it will create maps and pin them to the file system. And then when we need to upgrade, we need to cycle the process, but we want to re-pick up the, the existing map that, that exists on the file system. So that's, that's very much a, a part of what we do in Cilium, so we'll need that from the library, I think. And can we please coordinate so that libbpf pins things the same place as, as this thing? Yeah, uh, actually, that's probably one of the goals that I, that I have that I <laughs> Uh, ended up leaving off the slide, but there's a whole, whole bunch of things around the ELF format, um, yeah, things like the, the, the paths and where, where we pin things to the file system and so on that I think we need to make sure that libbpf and, and this library have a, a consistent sort of view on. Yeah, I guess sort of the meta question is that now that you're volunteering to, vo to maintain a whole separate library, are you also sort of committing to keeping all these semantics in sync with, uh, with libbpf? Yeah, so, I mean, in an ideal world, I think I'd like if you can just compile an ELF and then you just use whatever library uh, exactly. you know, loader is, yes, is, is available. Um, obviously, the devil's in the details, um, and, you know, we're going to have to work through the, the, the figuring out how we, we establish these, these standards and make sure that we keep in sync. Um, yes. Do we so I think the, the kind of the one point I want to make is this is not intended to be able to kind of, say, replace IP route with something that's based on this, right? I don't think that's the goal. Like this is for, you have a very, I mean, we have very specific needs to kind of orchestrate our data path and to kind of do stuff with BPF. And that's what the library exists for. It's not meant to kind of say, you know, replace, if you want to do an IP route attached to your XDP interface, then you should do that. And then, you know, this is not the right tool for you to use. So no, but don't, do things deliberately differently. Like I'm not saying don't like you no. should be able to do all the same things. It's just like you're re releasing this library as well, and you just know that we'll have users using it. And if it's not compatible, they will be confused. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So like, do we ha maybe we need some kind of functional, high-level tests that are not sort of in-program unit tests, but that sort of tests all of these larger semantics, such as I pin, I load this file, it will show up pinned as, at this location. Yeah, I think that would be great. I mean, the, the added, added thing is with the new GCC port is like, what kind of elf does GCC emit, right? Yay, it'll be fun. It's uh, so do you do the BTF-based pinning thing as well? Right now. How, how do you do pinning now? So right now the pin is a function. So you can, your application can pin wherever you have a BPFFS. So there's no default. There's no defaults. There's no defaults now. Okay, and it is like okay. So, so the first step. Um, so th this comes out of kind of a lengthy process, I should say. So we had a long discussion between kind of Cilium and Cloudflare, of what is the first thing that we want to put in the shared library, kind of in the sense, what's the minimum sensible thing to put there that we can build upon. And kind of the first thing is this this map and program. There's going to be a step two and a step three. And what we explicitly left out right now is kind of the, what I would call the ELF loader, exactly for the reasons that you kind of mentioned. It's not entirely clear how compatible, like in the best case, will be absolutely compatible with libbpf. But then do we need to be compatible with IP route two? Or yes, because do we need to be compatible with GCC? Or I mean, yeah. 
So, no, but uh, what, just like what do you usually do? Do you just like take the map name and put it into the FS? So for us, we don't pin maps at all. Okay, that works. <laughs> That's compatible. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm I'm not quite sure what's the plan for the loading. So what do you propose for the loading? Because you're saying program create. Create includes loading? Uh, yes and no. So this um, this is based on some work I did for, for the Cloudflare tooling. And you can create a program. And there's a Go package that allows you to assemble individual eBPF instructions. So for the purpose of the initial kind of code dump that we have, we can create like little testing programs to make sure our implementation works. Um, the Cilium people can kind of load a program from the file system and then attach it wherever they want, kind of interact with it in the normal way. And then in the follow-up, we'll add the eBPF loader, which actually takes an ELF, kind of puts it into this common format that we need, and then you can load into the kernel and do other stuff with it. So essentially, it, it, it ends up composing like these different bits together. That's the idea. Do you think about structuring it in such a way that you know, like all this heavy lifting and all the devil in the details is handled by libpf, where you probably don't care about this 10% overhead for C Go, right? And probably no one is going to debug it from Go into C on like what's going on wrong with libpf, right? You would probably go to the mailing list and like just say like doesn't work. Here is the example, and then like for the CRUD uh, operations, that could be done directly in Go, like through syscalls, right? That would eliminate all this like semantic synchronization that we will need to do, but will give you ultimate performance for whatever you want. That's true. Um, it doesn't fix the packaging problems and the API problems and kind of, yeah, I mean, if I point somebody at this library and say, hey, you want you know, go and use it. If I have a pure Go thing, they can go get it. They can run their thing. But imagine how many works. problems you create by getting out of sync with libpf. That is true. Well, uh, yeah. So, so some of this is also like, what do you do if you're not doing this? And for instance, maybe you're shelling out to IP Route 2 to, to achieve all that kind of stuff today. And then you don't get the level of integration, and you're not getting the latest, latest libvpf sync stuff either. You will. So, well, OK. <laughs> perhaps, at one point. Uh, perhaps at some point. Yeah. Well, the yeah, exact yeah. 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 Yeah, that, that's the reason we're fixing. That's the exact reason why we want to fix IP Route 2 to use libpf, because people are doing that, and they're running into this, uh, and it's a real problem. And uh, so we're just sort of preemptively trying to prevent you from creating, recreating the same problems that we already have with IP Route 2. Mm -hmm. uh, point. Just one more comment. It feels to me that now we are uh, kind of at the point where loading of the L file should eventually be done by the kernel. What yes, that would please. mean, right? So it kind of that's what kernel does. So if you just point to aid it out, right? So aid it out is done through this bin processing thingy. There is a format, there is LD data, so LD Linux data. So we kind of, I guess, at that point. So you should be able to just say, here is a file kernel go loaded, and how we do it, that's secondary question. But that will solve this Go thingy. You can still keep like all of the Go stuff as a Go, what you're saying, but the loading, the most complex part, dealing with BTF, updating the relocations, uh, all the call to call stuff and everything else that BPF, uh, BPF to BPF calls that it's doing and probably you don't, uh, like you will get for free from this like kernel loading. So we support BTF. So the, the loader in the other library has BTF to BTF calls. So that in theory works, but for other reasons we don't use it. Um, I, th I think it would be great if we could get to a point where the kernel can load the ELF, but then the kernel also has to allow us to modify the eBPF in some way, because that's a lot of the, I mean, kind of as the, the maturity, as, as eBPF has matured, I think there's been more tools to say the ELF file, you can, you can load that verbatim into the kernel, right? So the, the, the idea that the ELF file is this declarative thing of everything you need to actually load into the kernel. That's kind of the assumption that you're making, right? And in the, in the process of building our daemon or our software, we found that often the time we've had to work around things where we need to you know, change some config and all this other stuff. So I, I, I think there's always going to be cases where we need to be able to just kind of load the ELF and then do something with it and then put it into the kernel as a program. Want to continue? 
Sure, I'll try. <laughs> uh, so, our, so our step two is, is perf events. Um, so at the moment, we use Seago for this. Um, it obviously has certain, certain costs associated with uh, going to the Seago. Um, so we'd like to get a, a native implementation that will improve that. Um, I mean, that translates directly to CPU cycles and, and the amount of time, the number of events we can handle from BPF. Um, structurally, that would probably be as a, as a sub -pod package, but um, I guess that's um, up to future, uh, um, future work. And uh, I guess this is the slide that we were basically just talking about um, in terms of, yeah, what, is it, what does it look like? Do we want to do L floater? How much of L floater do we do? BTF support. Um, global variables is interesting for both of our use cases, um, but uh, based on some of the earlier um, discussion in this session, it sounds like um, some of that stuff is, is sort of moving more into, into BTF and um, exactly how much of that makes sense to have in a Golang library versus something else is, is sort of up for debate. Um, but uh, so the main point of this is, is really to, um, to let people know we're starting to work on this. If you're interested in a Golang library, um, you know, chat with us, uh, tell us what you're interested in. Um, you know, we'd, we'd love to have uh, more, more people involved. I think the main concern that we hear from people is, so this problem exists because of language fragmentation, and now we're going to have, as a result, library fragmentation, and what is the propagation rate of bug fixes from libbpf into your thing, and vice versa. Right? So it's like this lack of synchronization because there's no central repository of implementation of these useful facilities. So, so here we go. Earlier in the day, in the networking track, we were talking about centralization, centralizing things by putting them into the kernel, and here we hear the thing all over again. Let's, mm -hmm. let's just move all the elf loading into the kernel and make, make it happen there. But that does not solve the case of dynamic code generation, which is going to be a common way to do things with BPF, because you'll want to optimize out facilities you don't use at all. That's like one of the, to me, that's one of the powers of BPF. You can optimize the code down to what you actually are doing on your system. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, it just I hope we can keep things in sync and not lose bug fixes in either direction and just kind of stay on top of things. Uh, uh, one last comment: like, will it help if you guys develop it in the kernel tree, at least? <laughs> you, you want to add GoLang code into the kernel tree? Is that do I do I Dave? What do you think? <laughs> I'm all for it. <laughs> I think uh, we might just do that for the novelty of it. I think it was like <laughs> the first Go package in the kernel. Nice. Uh, and I guess but Rust is next, or. Yeah. <laughs> but I think the problem was also on rendering that you cannot simply pull this into your library because then you would have to sort of pull the whole kernel into your <laughs> into your Go project, right? So. Yeah. And the thing that we're seeing is that like more and more companies using BPF and XDP and tracing and whatnot, and they all come up with their own Go library. So like, there's uh, actually a huge Go community, and that's. Actually, the effort that's trying to consolidate it into one thing that people can rely on. Right? Maybe this idea of having kind of trying to work out what the ELF format is is a good one, right? I mean, I was talking to Jose earlier. It's like something that he's interested in for the GCC backend. It seems like and LibBPF wants to figure out what it is. We'd like to know what the format is, you know. You, you could perhaps put it in the kernel repository and create some automatically synced other partial Git repository that has only the Go pieces, so that people that want to pull it in from Go don't need to pull in the whole kernel, but are still getting a fully up-to-date version. We're doing that with the BPF right now. Yeah. So, so, so the next step, uh, so if you apply a patch to, send a patch for libbpf, do you need to also send a patch for the Golang uh, piece in the, in the kernel tree? <laughs> but the other question is, I mean, so the, the, the other thing to consider is maybe like then this library at some point could potentially become part of the core Go package. Yes, that's another direction so. that we could go. And if we keep minimal dependencies, maybe, maybe yeah. they're open to it to that. I, I don't actually talk to Golang sort of core people, but. You mentioned there was was the key, right? If you can have these functional tests that would ensure compatibility, and you can run that, and you can get that these are the core assertions that these two libraries have to have to adhere to. 
it should, in theory, work. Uh, as that, like, that needs continuous integration yeah. of some sort. The big drawback is that it makes it harder to kind of innovate in libppf, basically, because you can't just kind of go and, you know, uh, add a feature. You kind of, oh, and you, you know, you need to coordinate. I don't know if we're at that stage right now where you, w where you want to make that commitment. It's kind of up for discussion, I guess. Mm -hmm. The last comment? Yes, so, okay, I just made it a sort of meta comment, but the problem is like libppf is the spec right now, right? We don't have a spec that we can re-implement. Like, we don't have an RFC, we don't have, so that becomes the spec, and now you're, a, an independent implementation should be a good thing, but because the spec is also code, it becomes really difficult to get them in sync. So like, and, and CI and automated testing is right, like the only way we have to, to ensure this. So we need to have something like that. It would be good if BPF had, BPF had CI, I'd yeah. say. Yeah, exactly. OK. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I think they break, they break afterwards, right? The break after this one? We have a break after this one, yes. Yeah, yeah, so we'll make the break short. Okay, but we have because to set up the laptop as well. But like 10 minutes should be okay to get 10 minutes, like shift. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah I have Yeah, I have 10 minutes. Okay, let's get started. Hello, hello. So good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Song Liu, and uh, I know everyone knows Alexi here, so nothing to introduction. <laughs> and so we don't usually do new capabilities, so let's do two at a time. <laughs> so, so this is what we have now. We have two very powerful syscalls, like uh, sysperf even open and sysbpf. Now they are all under, like, uh, pretty much mostly under cap sysadmin, which you can do something like uh, small things with them without uh, sysadmin, but uh, that's really limited, very limited uh, features. So, but this makes, if you want to use either of them, you will need a cap sysadmin, which give you something more than what you need. And this is very dangerous in many use cases. So what we were proposing is to cap, uh, to create two capabilities for each of them, so that uh, for users who only need uh, one of them or both of them, you don't need a cap sysadmin. And the best benefit is like uh, you're going to be able to remove your root file system by mistake. So, so mostly like uh, we focus on BPF. So there will be there. There are two use cases with BPF. One is the tracing users. You're probably going to need a cap BPF and a cap tracing instead of cap sysadmin. Hopefully that uh, will give your tracing a lot safer, not uh, ruin stuff. And another use case is uh, uh, BPF networking, which will already have net admin, which is good when you need a cap BPF and a cap net admin. So this is currently our proposed uh, uh, capability control of all the function, all the commands within this BPF. And I don't know what we would discuss uh, yet, but maybe we can come back uh, to this page later. And when so, uh, uh, so the one, the one <laughs> thing that changed, uh, sorry to jump in, uh, mm -hmm. since uh, we've created this slide, earlier today we discussed with uh, Jesper and Toki that with this, this with MapFG, so some of the map operations like uh, lookup, update, and delete, we should just 
allow without uh, any checks whatsoever, without even unprivileged check, without uh, currently they're actually gated by unprivileged BPF disables this control, and some companies set it already to one and completely disable anything, including like reading, reading and writing to the map, which is uh, kind of goes against the open and write style of like file system permissions. If you open a file, you get an FD, there is no write uh, checks on read and write because you do everything at the open as a standard security stuff. Whereas on PF, we kind of do extra checks for some reason during the uh, lookup and update into the map, which is kind of unnecessary. And so we're thinking that we will sort of relax this with map of D, uh, this uh, box with map of D would actually mean that this is just, if you get an FD uh, to your map, you like in the map is read only, you will be able to read it. Yes, if, if you opened it and during the open, we check that it's read writable, you will be able to read and write into it. And I think this probably also goes in line with when you have BTF attached to a map, you could also just dump the contents through the file system itself, right? So you can already read it as far as I'm aware, so that would just, yeah, that would be consistent. So considering that there is this thing of unprivileged BPF, um, I, I've been wondering whether um, CAPSIS admin is, like should we just be checking for you have CAPSIS admin or CAPNET admin and just allow BPF stuff if you have either of those? Mm. So, in, in thinking about capabilities, um, I'm all for trying to get rid of the use of CAPSIS admin, um, but it's less about what you're doing and more about what uh, what you have access to, what you can read. You know, are you looking at network socket? You know, are you looking at network packets? Um, that's one set of of access control. Uh, are you looking at Kernel memory. Do you have access to like what? What are the things you have access to? Which seems to me through seems to be exposed mostly through the helpers. Um, so I, I'm not sure if the maybe the commands map to something, but um, it seems like access control is almost more tied to what helpers you have access to at any at any you know through a program. That is true. That's. So uh, why this cap, let's say, so just BPF alone does not allow you to like read uh, anything networking because you still need CapNet admin to attach and then to read because if you don't attach, you you cannot read anything. That's why we, we did the whole attach with net admin in the first place because that's kind of basic capability you need to do networking. So it's kind of the same take and the same. So what 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 trying to propose here is that that's what we did for net admin effectively and the same idea to do it for tracing. So introduce kind of, there is net admin, there is cap tracing, call it cap trace admin, I don't know. So I think, uh, I think the, uh, part of this uh, we probably need to check uh, your the capability in the verifier. If you do not have certain capability, you should not call certain helper. Is that your uh, question? Well, I think that's a, uh, we, we didn't think about that. Can do it as well. It's just like net admin already prevents it. So this is like will be just additional check. Uh, right. I think maybe the other way, if you want, you have net admin, but you do not have cap tracing, maybe you should not do something. Right. Um, I really do want a cap tracing. To me, cap tracing is something that. Um, allows you to see inside the kernel. I think, I think you probably would agree. Because right now, I hate the fact that I have to be root to do F-trace. Um, that I really, I, I mean, I have to be root to, for specific reasons. It's, a, it's definitely a privileged command, but it would be really nice to say, cap, give my process cap tracing, and now I can do all my tracing and not, like I said, do anything else that's more dangerous. So. Yeah, uh, I want to add to that. I forgot to mention, like, uh, uh, this uh, cap tracing should include like uh, access to trace FS and which I, I didn't uh, include uh, in the when we wrote the when I wrote the slide but that should be included there and so, I, and so I think cap, cap tracing seems very nice but it's not clear to me um, what cap BPF how cap BPF plus cap net admin is better than just cap net admin I, have an answer to that uh, I was just gonna follow up on the tracing there's so think about it. 
you can't make an attachment point without NetAdmin, but just by having cap BPF, you could test a BPF program by the user providing his own buffer into the test framework. So this is, goes back to his yeah. access to what data do you have. Right. And, and for, for tracing, it's like, well, do you have read access? Do you have write access? Like, those are the levels. Like, that's basic access control. Like, read only? Is it read write? I say Right, and I'm saying there might be people who want just read. And that's a, that's a smaller capability subset. I'm not sure if this is, well, because I haven't really used cap capabilities, but I think I like it. But the fact that it's like, say if you have capabilities on, you might get access. Right now, um, the debugFS directory or the, the trace directory is, you can't, it's like you have to be root to see it. And once you have trace, um, I would say if you have cap tracing, I guess it would give you access to it. And I don't know if we should allow, should it be a read write or should we have follow the, uh, should the file system the, follow the file system permissions then? So you need to have both the file system permissions as well as um, cap, cap tracing, which means you probably need to create a new group, and when you mount TraceFS, you have to say, okay, mount it with this group, and so you have access to it. So I think the one use case that they mentioned was testing. The other thing is clear segregation of capabilities also uh, like helps extend use cases for BPF. So for the LSM use case that we're trying to come up with, Cap BPF, cap pack admin, or clear segregation of who can uh, attach a BPF program, and what can they do with that? Uh, can, do they have Mac admin to configure an LSM policy or something like that? That's so that's the good point. Indeed, for for like yourself, cap BPF plus cap Mac admin as two of them, kind of fits yeah. this model as well. And makes I, sense. On, on the sort of on the topic of grouping different things, I think we've already mentioned it on the on the list. But having CPU map and cap sys admin, that's that's an XDP feature, so that means you can use all of XDP except this one thing, and then you certainly need caps as admin for that. And I, I, so, can we move that to CapNet? I know it created case threats and so on, but it, it, there's no other use for it than XDP, and suddenly we're using, we're requiring caps as admin for XDP. And the only other, I'm uh, not entirely convinced it's capabilities are the right approach, but it doesn't matter, but having something that gives you the access control. There's a lot of baggage on capabilities and how it how it's uh, you know passes from process to process on fork and like there's a whole bunch of things. Now, if those are helpful, fine, okay, capabilities. But you know, I, if how finely granular you get, you start losing some amount of utility. Like if you're saying you can use all of that but not this, even though both give you read access to the same data, who cares? It should be on the same capability. Um, even yeah. Even with uh, uh, read access only, uh, uh, read only access, uh, I think that uh, there is uh, some, uh, some uh, con uh, uh, considerations or concerns about the security um, because that the uh, uh, cap cap tracing will uh, expose that the some symbol address uh, information, so that the uh, it it just uh, the policy, but uh, yeah. <laughs> We need to uh, consider about that there, you know, uh, the proc all seems uh, yes. also are uh, exposed that there trace cap trace. That was in the thread. Uh, in the thread, I mentioned that. Okay. Uh, well, I want to expose everything that you. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. My point is, I would like cap almost cap tracing, or it could just be would be basically another um, way of saying allow me to read, like, throw away the security of you know, where, what's inside the kernel. I could see basically anything inside the kernel. Cap tracing, basically, it's a very privileged thing. You don't give it to anyone. Just, it's basically, I just want, I have control of my machine, or I, I'm the admin of the machine, I want to see what's going on, but I also don't want to run something that might root my machine, because it now has, I, you know, I do a sudo or something like that, I give myself full privileges to do anything to a machine. I only want access to the tracing mechanisms. Yes, there, it's going to expose stuff, but I'm limiting it to only just that, which will include proc chaos sims. It'll give me access to, basically, cap tracing to me is, give me access to read anything, basically. It, it sounds like cap tracing has to be only in the root namespace, but uh, for net admin, you definitely would like to be able to do stuff in other namespaces, other network namespaces especially. So kind of like, how do these capabilities interact with namespaces? Uh, well, that's that's why I'm not sure it's a good mapping capabilities themselves. But I mean, what we have is you know cap sysadmin, which is read write. We want a cap sysadmin that is read only. That's what tracing would be like. But 
now we're getting back to DAC, like basic DAC access control. So yeah, so this is definitely not like ideal and not fine grained. The whole point here that is way better than what we have today. So that's why, like, I think this is not the best. Of course, like many different proposals were made to make it fine grained, and we should definitely make it more fine grained. This is just like a first step. And if someone just p adds the cap tracing, I don't really care about the cap PPF. That's all your your your, your <laughs> folks. I just be happy with the cap tracing, and I'll 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 go on with that. Awesome. So uh, I want to highlight one thing is like uh, we're not proposing to set cap BPF to your BPF2, nor cap set cap, cap BPF to your BPF trace, not cap set cap, cap tracing for perf. Just, these tools are just way too powerful. Like you're not giving that to everyone. But on the other hand, we with this cap, we're able to build like other tools that could be safe for untrusted users. Like one thing we were discussed is like uh, uh, function func count is one of the like safest BPI, BCC tools, but it's probably not as safe as is. As, but we do think it's possible to make it safe by limiting how many uh, points you can trace and like uh, make, maybe no. also how heavy these traces are. No, not with cap tracing. Do you know? Do you know what fun count does? Well, I don't. You know, I just uh, it's you're opening up a file. I mean, matters how secure, how simple is that? It's a, first of all, it ends with py, which really scares the hell out of me. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I have no idea what Python actually does. Everything. Everything. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But, but could you imagine or maybe a native compile the funk count? <laughs> but is, is it interesting to then write some application that does a bunch of you know it, it uses this cap tracing, but then it populates a BPF map, which you know based on the way that you write it, you know you're not exposing information you don't want to expose to unprivileged, and then unprivileged just opens up that map and then can can read out of you know this, this pre-summarized information that you put in the map. That would be sort of like if you want that fine grain, then you have to go all the way down to say like what what data are you looking at? Like, is is that considered privileged, or is it just like something else? Yeah. Yeah. If you have the ability to read from a map without any access checks, you can build that yourself by just passing the FD to the map to as that process that then drops privileges in it. Yeah, like if you open it, you open it privileged and load the BPF program, and then you pass the read-only FD down to the sub, the child of the drops privileges. Well, uh, I guess there is the somebody raised the point about fine grain access control, right? Is there like a LSM policy for because cap capabilities is what you can do, but if you want to do more fine grain access checks, like people in terms of what helpers you can execute with a particular program, are there policies around BPF stuff? There is already a LSM check and BPF. But can you do fine-grained access controls with that LSM? Uh, like you mean through the SE Linux or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. doubt the SE Linux implemented any of it. But okay, okay. But could it? Why not? There is some SC Linux integration with BPF, but it is more along the lines of, like, are you allowed to create maps or look at maps or update maps? It doesn't get any more specific than that. Any SE Linux developers in the room? <laughs> Security stuff. Security stuff. Yeah, we lost that. Let's all run in here at the same time. Open the door. So well, that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. Let me start. Hi everyone, sorry, so uh, because of the visa issues, I can only do this in remote mode. So today my topic is uh, how to reuse host uh, JIT backends as an offload backend. So agenda, so first why we do we need this, then I will talk about how BPF program is uh, turned into a runnable image. 
uh, including both host jet and the offload jet. So after that, then let's say how some improve, improvements could be do could be done to uh, make the uh, BPF jet backends with better modularity. Then finally, I will uh, do a basic uh, introduction on some of the eBPF offload prototyping work that uh, we are doing. Uh, on a smart nick with uh, risk five inside so first why do we need this uh, so obviously because uh, a bpf could be offloaded so at the moment uh, the offload mostly happen on networking devices uh, for example smart nick uh, for example metronome nft uh, perhaps there could be other bpf offload scenario in the future i think once device drive driver could be written using bpf so also for the offload, obviously you want to use the uh, architecture with a strong ecosystem. For example, RISC V or ARM32 or AX64 or even BPF itself. So and for all this uh, uh, architectures, actually we have a stable host host JET backends already. So when used as offload, actually no difference on the processor. So there's a code gen. The i size is the same, the code generation is the same. So the only difference is how we install the program. Uh, that is, uh, the runtime is uh, different, so linking is different. So uh, actually, we really want to reuse. So we really want to reuse the uh, code generation of uh, the host jet, which also the biggest part. So first, how a BPF program is uh, uh, turned into a runnable image. So a runnable image, I think it must uh, have all the instructions translated and obviously all the external reference relocated. Uh, for BPF program, mostly maps, uh, static global data, which also maps and the branches and the calls to helpers and BPF, BPF calls. Hence, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, this sense should be relocated. And the current BPF jet infrastructure to achieve this is uh, we turn the C to relocatable BPF uh, data, which is a uh, data contains BPF ISA, and we do a linking on BPF ISA. Then the BPF, the fully re relocated BPF image, is uh, faded to the jet backends, then generate the final image. So it's not uh, uh, relocatable. Uh, so the relocation generally it's not happen on the native image, it's uh, happen on the BPF uh, ISA. So there's two, then there's two main stages for the current JIT uh, backend compilation. One is uh, pre-linking the BPF data. The second is uh, after that, we uh, drive the JIT backends to do code generation. So for the pre-linking, for host jet, first is uh, when there is no BPF to BPF call, so then the sends are very simple. So input is a BPF sequences. I think the only external symbol reference is a map symbol at the moment because the function, the external function is only helper function, which is uh, casted into uh, uh, index using the, because it's absolute address. So then the user space loader, uh, it will create map. And during that process, it rewrites the uh, instruction to the uh, map index. And uh, so then the, in the color space, what you got is uh, sequences uh, with uh, all the external reference turned into index. And uh, later in, in the color verifier, there is a map and a helper code rewriter, which query the runtime system, query what's the uh, address for that index, then rewrite the instruction, rewrite the BPF instruction with those uh, absolute address. So then after that, everything is uh, pre-linked. Then, but if there's a BPF to BPF call, I think things are different. And because currently we are doing the relocation on BPF ISA, so I think this flow, there's a diagram. That's because uh, the up the final address we want is the uh, address on the native image but the relocation is performed on the bpf isa so but you can't know the final address uh you, ca you can only know the final address after you finished the code generation so currently we've resolved this problem uh, this issue using a uh, dry run so during verification during the pre-linking, actually, we also call uh, jet backends to do a dry run compilation to get the function call, the sub-program address. Then 
after that, with we we record the backends with all the sub program sub program address to finalize all the addresses. So in all, after the pre-linking, we got uh, BPF sequences has all the address finalized, and uh, then actually this approach uh, uh, largely simplified the JIT backends. So the JIT backends, what you need to do is just do one-to-one -one mapping of instructions and uh, resolve the uh, local branch. So so normally the BPF currently the B, uh, the BPF JIT backends uh, normally it's two paths. The first pass generate the instruction and also record the instruction offsets, which will be used to resolve local branch. But uh, there's uh, one thing is uh, BPF is uh, I think it's all pieces relative jump or call. But at the moment, the JIT backends, some backends, for, for example, AX64, it will turn uh, pieces relative call into an absolute uh, call using BRR instruction. So to summary for the host jet, I think uh, mostly it's uh, the user space and the kernel space loaders. It perform perform various pre-linkings uh, based on BPF ISA, and mostly the pre-linking using three simple tables. Uh, which, uh, the first one is a map to map address. The second is a helper address table. So the third is a function address table. And the uh, jet backends uh, interleave with pre-linking because of the flow diagram mentioned. And also some jet backends generate long position independent code sequences because uh, using BRR instruction, et cetera. And also the final, the native uh, image generated doesn't contain any relocation information because we think uh, everything ends after the JIT compilation because there is no runtime loader, those things. So the whole code just runs on the fly. Then for uh, BPF offload, uh, things are a little bit different. So for static offload, uh, actually it's uh, nearly the same. That's because uh, I think for, I define static offload as uh, the offload device uh, allocate maps, also helpers, and the code is uh, code space is reserved on the offload device at a fixed point. So actually, for offload, so for static offload, the uh, device driver should load all the addresses for data and code before doing the code generation, which means uh, you can also use the same flow as the host jet. Generally, you can pre-link in the BPF the BPF uh, object file and then fade the link the BPF object to the jet backends, to the host jet backends, because the host jet backends exactly just expect the input to be a fully off relocated BPF object. So I think the only change needed is uh, the replace map FD and the fix up BPF call those hooks, which is used to query the, to query the address uh, uh, based on the input index, this hooks maybe this functions maybe uh, maybe some tweaks for offload. Uh, then for dynamic offload, uh, so generally the code is uh, the code might be allocated by loader at runtime. So you the device uh, won't load or the host side won't load the code address uh, before the really run it. But I think at the moment, most of the host jet, if you are using those ISA like uh, ARM, RISC-V, you can generate peak sequences. So actually, because data is always pre-allocated, it's with a fixed address on the device. That's a typical case. So actually, if your code sequence is peak, there's still there's a low difference with static offload. Your image can just be uploaded to anywhere, then you can run from anywhere, it just works. So and there's no need of runtime information. So uh, one real example is uh, NFT BPF offload uh, because NFT is a little bit complex because we don't have this relative jump. So everything is absolute jump. So we can't do it at, uh, uh, so at the moment what we are doing is we remain those map index, helper index in BPF sequences. Generally we, we completely skip the the BPF pre-linking happened on the host side. Then we pass those index down 
to the runtime loader on the device. The loader actually then use uh, then it, it and also we encode the relocation information in the instruction itself because uh, it's lucky that uh, NFT instruction is uh, 64 bytes with some top bits not used. So we use those uh, reserved bits as uh, to encode relocation information. So then we have a runtime loader on device which can relocate the image to relocate those, uh, the jump to the runtime code address. So which I think if the device driver, if, if, if your BPF offload have a complex offload scenario, maybe it, it should follow the similar uh, flow. So to summary, I think uh, after some investigation, I believe the current hosted JIT backends could perhaps be used as offload JIT backends directly just with little change because the uh, native data and the code are created, are created separately. So generally data, you always got a fixed address, uh, either with host or offload. And uh, for the code themselves could be picked. So you can load to anywhere and run it. So maybe there are some other things, matters that is, for example, for the offload jet, you need to generate some runtime runtime stuff, for example, return from man. Now you, you should return to some firmware exits, not not like a host return. And uh, there has maybe some runtime error handling. So generally those things, if the device, I think device should expose, the, could expose those addresses to offload jets. Otherwise, um, the offload image still, you need to encode the relocation information. Uh, that could be a problem for MIPS, uh, for uh, for Risk of Five or ARM32 because uh, you don't you need extra header on the image, which is not nice. But I think no other choice. And uh, so so after all this, I think uh, still we need some minor improvements uh, on the current JIT backends to make it could be reused as offload backends. Uh, that's because uh, first we need to enable multiple JIT backends, right? Because uh, uh, the offload scenario is uh, a host x86. Uh, you know, for example, you can and you can have multiple offload devices, and uh, you definitely you want to uh, uh, enable several backends. At the moment, we only enable the host backends. So the solution is, uh, so I think we can split the BPF init JET compiler into BPF internal JET compiler plus the architect uh, arc compiler. So then for if there's no offload, last and changed, still it's the same uh, strong symbol override the weak symbol uh, technology we used. But if there's offload, so generally the, because we split the, the interface uh, fire into two, so also, the user can use extra config to enable the build of a, a particular backend, for example, Risk Five. And uh, at the moment, I think the Jet BPF backend is quite independent, and you don't need to build the whole arc. It, it, that file may, can self-stand. You can just build it, just build it with some uh, simple uh, header file included. So then the other thing is uh, there's, uh, there has some space to improve in the backends itself. For example, I think I feel we should uh, try to generate peak code as much as possible if the distance fades into the encoding. Also, it's better we just the backend, the JS backends just do code gen. You don't, don't do those runtime stuff. For example, I cache flash, those things may be refactored to some other hook. Only do it if you want to run it on the host. And the third is maybe probably we can split compilation and linking. Uh, because uh, this can release us from the dilemma of uh, run the the verifier dry run, the interleaving of uh, pre-linking with the uh, compilation. So maybe also can make the the compiler link stage more clean, maybe. Or, uh, yeah, so just some basic ideas because I think the link hook can be just have a input uh, relocatable program with uh, three sample table or, or can be combined into one. Uh, so you just relocate using the index, map index, helper index, you query the table, then you rewrite the, 
of image, but uh, the difference is uh, now the linking will happen on the native ISR instead of BPI, BPF ISR. So the linking should uh, the link hook should be implemented for all the backends. So and also offload the infrastructure because uh, the previously are talking about JIT backends, but it's offload the JIT. So also there is offload the infrastructure. So this infrastructure could be improved slightly for if we are offloading for generic uh, risk five processor because i think the infrastructure was designed for an F nft offload it's for example it bypass the whole pre-linking but for as talked for generic offload we still could use the same flow we could we could still go through those uh, same code so it's a little bit overkilling we can improve and also the current offload infrastructure was more or less designed for late device maybe if we want we have some other offload the scenario maybe it's simpler we don't need those let dev structure those things so finally it's a uh, hardware uh, software prototyping so Letronome has a risk of five uh, based uh, smart nick so that's uh, generally it's a uh, uh, multi-core uh, uh, it's a multi-core design with the transaction memory to easy the uh, the sync between multi cores. So I'm not going to this in details because too many to say. So just the slides you can, if you're interested, you can check. And uh, generally it's a simple, it's a standard uh, uh, risk of 32 bit with the integer and compressed instruction set. And with uh, uh, like 40, uh, 64K instruction memory. And the uh, standard, and you can use it for stack and for code those things. So we got uh, FPGA implementation, and uh, currently our model is uh, the for a typical C program model uh, is uh, you just write a C program, you compile using standard using your standard risk five glue chain into a F file, then you can use F GDB GDB uh, you can use a GDB or F run to load it to the to talk to the gdb remote stop on the arm con fpg arm controller then the remote stop offload the things to the fpga cores to the risk of app cores then for the bpf offload it's things are much complex uh, much more complex sir. so we need to verify generally verify two things first is uh, offload when we reuse risk of five uh, bpf backend it generates correct image second is uh, the bpf program works so for the first part, we our my thought actually is uh, we implement a dummy net dev driver, implement all those necessary hooks. So then we have a BPF program, uh, LV, the same LVM to chains and the theory map uh, during the I think it's uh, user space loader lib BPF and create map with redirect map for it create to a networking request to the GDB stop, ask it to create map on the FPGA RFPC. Then uh, we talk, we keep going down, talk to the curler driver and uh, ask it to drive the whole risk of five jet uh, backends to generate uh, uh, the translated BPF image. Later we use BPF tour to query the translated image but then we need to turn it in because it's raw instruction. We turn it to a loadable elf. Then we use the same uh, elf run or GDB to talk to the remote stop, ask it to inject the code to the RFPC to the to the offload code. And uh, the offload code should have a pre-installed firmware which is just keep pulling the events. Then once it says there is a remote stop injected BPF code, it jump to the code. And also we need the emulation uh, packet generator on the running on the ARM board to generate packets. So it can actually it maybe just write something to some shared memory, the BPF program and fetch the uh, packets from there. So the whole thing is because uh, currently we finished the RFPC, the risk of five core side, uh, the periphery, the networking stuff, we are still catching up. So we can only use uh, the, these, these things to emulate. So yeah, that's pretty much everything I want to share today. So, adding questions. So we have one. So we have time for one question or comment. Who wants to go? Well, no. Yeah, yeah. If 
no one does, I have a question. Uh, so uh, I think if we, like in general, the, I really like the idea of having more than one JIT uh, compiled into the kernel because I think we've talked about it before, it will help testing like tremendously, uh, all the different JITs. But if we do it, we should do it not only for the uh, RISC-V uh, JIT, but for uh, X86 as well. So like, because every time we do it, something like special for like NFP specific or RISC-V specific, whatever, it's just not bit rot. Mm -hmm. So if we do it, this type of uh, uh, peak style JIT generation, uh, should be done for x86 as a, as a minimum. Uh, then the, another idea I had like while talking, do we really need to do this uh, pick uh, code? Can it be instead as a, done as a set of callbacks into the JIT? Because at the end when this, let's say this is risk five JIT is generating this stuff and further flowed in the generating code moving into the uh, processors the processor know where they will move it to. So it can be done as a callback. They will provide that JIT that it will be in that memory and like talk to me through the callbacks for every decision you need to make in terms of where all the helpers are instead of doing it later phase as this relocations. Okay. So you mean peak code is not necessary, right? Well, it's kind of peak code, but not Quite. So I was just hoping maybe it will be simpler instead of doing pick. Okay. Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, kind of think pick is good. You can just uh, run it anywhere. <laughs> Given the data, we don't. The data is always, I think, fixed. You you won't move it, and you always know the address of the data for any scenario at the moment. So yeah. Yeah, the only problem I run into is, uh, for, for example, NFP prototyping is uh, it's uh, absolute jump. So we don't have peak code, so we need some extra relocation, we need a runtime loader. I think this issue can be largely simplified for other architectures. Okay, one last question from yeah. Mario. Um, so what's the point in having the JIT for another architecture at the kernel level? Why isn't it at, uh, in user space? Uh, to, I can probably answer just to reuse because it's already written. It's already in the kernel. Yeah, but that same code could be ported to user space and be used independently as a user space process. It's. Uh... You could basically upload a a, a raw by already jitted bytecode uh, code right uh, that bypasses all the jit infrastructure and just gets get gets pushed to the uh, the, the other system. The verifier could be in user space. I mean, the kernel verifiers provides integrity for the kernel, but you're shipping to a different system anyway. So, I mean, what's no, the trust not, level? It's not a different system. It's a nick on the same system. You're right. pushing it down. So you already did the verification. Yeah, but can you upload this as a simple user, or, or is it limited to root? Anyway, I think we have to table it. We already, already. <laughs> sorry, sorry, John. Like we already five, five, five minutes <laughs> over. Okay. We'll talk more in my presentation later. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll get going, I think, because we're short on time. So um, this more or less comes from some work we did about a year ago with Jung, where we actually put a full CFG in the verifier and found all the loops and verified that the loops were also natural loops, and then um, sort of brute forced through the loops to verify they terminated a bunch of safety properties about them. And then um, this is a, be a better version of that. So um, so we use SCEV. Uh, SCEV is a... a uh, a pass in both LLVM and GCC. Um, if you don't know what it does, the basic idea is to understand how variables change with execution. 
So, um, and you can find it in most optimizing compilers. They'll have, they'll have a path for this. Um, but to make it a little more concrete, uh, generally it's used on loops um, to sort of establish a set of conditions on the loop. So the, primarily so you can pull induction variables outside of the loops um, and optimize the loop case. Um, what we're going to use it here for is to establish that the loops terminate and that memory accesses are bounded. So um, because we only have a limited time, I think the best way to go about it is rather than, is rather than try to establish what SCEV is and is not and go through sort of theoretical points, I think the best way is to just do an example and then show how that works with BPF and we'll go from there. So this is a simple for loop. I actually just cut it out of one of the examples in the BPF samples program and actually just for simplicity, it, it, I think the one in the actual um, kernel code base actually has a for loop inside of it, but I cut it out because um, then we would have to talk about that as well and this is, fits on one slide easier. So once you run that through CLang and do an object dump, here's the, here's the code that it generates. Um, one thing to note is we added a new instruction called in loop, which denotes where the end of the for loop is. So it is um, basically the bottom of this for loop. Um, the reason we did that, so in the original code, we had to find all of the loops. And this means you have to build a full configuration, um, control flow graph. And then you have to walk through that and try to decide what are, what are good loops and bad loops that you can even um, verify. So instead of doing that in the verifier in the kernel, we do this in LLVM as a, as a backend uh, and part of the BPF backend. And then we can insert this extra instruction here. And then we, when we want to JIT and actually run this program, we just no opt that out. It gets removed and it's no longer there. I think if another option would be to use BTF for this probably and annotate it and not have an extra instruction. Um, but oh well. So that's what we have for now. Um, and so what I want to do is walk through what the verifier does with this code. Um, where we're going to start is the verifier has run through all of this code, is doing its um, sort of execution of the code, and it just tripped on the in loop. So in this big switch statement that analyzes the instructions as you walk through them, it goes, oh, this is an in loop instruction. And so the instruction pointer points at that if statement right above it. And the instruction count is whatever line number that is right there. So the first thing it's going to do is follow that go to. And it's going to start doing its SCEV analysis. So what it's doing is it creates an array of all of the registers um, that the system has, along with all the stack slots, because we can push things in and out of the stack. And so and then the first thing it does is then says, OK, that's a move of R2 to R5. Um, so we're basically just trying to trace all of the flows through this for loop. All right, so we can keep walking through this list and we can go and create what these are called SCEV expressions here. And the way to read those, um, the R5, R5, R0, is at each step as we go, R5 was first a move, an R2 move into R5, and then we have another move, but we ended it with one. And the underscore at the beginning is, is meant to be the... Um, the initial condition of that register. But because in the, um, I guess technically we know it, but when this code is being executed in, in the verifier that, that I wrote here, I just leave it blank and we'll fill it in um, at the end. And so the next problem we have is we've just ran to an if, if statement and we don't have um, like proper phi nodes and all this kind of stuff, phi nodes that we would have in like a real compiler. So what we're going to do is walk each possible branch in the code. And basically what we do is we get a trace through the code of every possible control flow um, possibility from the start of the loop back through it. So we'll continue. And um, because this was a go to the LLB0 underscore three there, we jump back over onto that side and start running this trace. And you can see we have some more R0, R0, R2, R5. Um, and we're just kind of doing the same thing. And if we get multiple, uh, like multiple, uh, sorry, look at like R0, for example, where we've done multiple, a move, and then we did a multiplication, or, and then an addition. So we just keep tacking those on, and that's actually kept as a sort of a tree data structure as you walk through. With one uh, little bit of complication here. So when we do a, a move, we want to both keep, uh, the 
register that's being moved in because we need that for the initial conditions. But we also copy all of the state from the last one so that when we're looking at this, we can say, well, R5 at this point is really whatever its initial state is plus one because it's an it's a assignment from R2. Okay. Now, the next thing that is a bit odd in this trace, because I, I didn't try to doctor this trace too much to make it nice, is it has this shift left and shift right. Uh, it's just clearing some bits. But um, it's a bit ugly from trying to understand what's going on. So we just sort of walk those through. And then eventually you get down to the condition. Let's just skip through that. So at this point, we've walked an entire trace. Sorry, I have to take a step back. We've walked an entire trace through the for loop. Um, we pushed a, when we did that if statement in the LBB01 over here on the right, we basically pushed something on our stack of traces so that we know to pop it and go back and finish that trace later. But what we got, what we get when we come out of this, and I didn't prick, I don't have any stack um, loads or stores here, so we don't have to worry about the stack, is basically the output of the verifier that we push into the log if we're running in like a verbose mode. And what it's, what it's showing is basically the state of all the registers that it knows about. And um, what you can see from back here is the one we're going to actually care about is R5. And if you look at R5, it has an unknown initial state because we haven't plugged that in, but it's adding one to it. And if you look back here to the for loop, you can, um, you can see, clearly, uh, see that from the j equals 0, j less than 300, j plus plus. Um, the other thing to note about this, and I think I have a slide as I highlighted it here, is I, I didn't actually implement the logic to handle multiplication in this example um, in, the code, in the verifier code that's running this example. And so what it did is it just marked it as unknown instead of a proper add um, instruction. Uh, and basically, that means I, the verifier lost track of what that register is doing. So um, that's sort of its way to back out of not knowing what's going on. If these instructions get too complicated or your data structure starts using too much memory, eventually you just go, I throw your hands up and go, I don't know what's going on. So market is unknown. All right, so now we have that, that table. And the important one from the table is the reg number five, because if we looked at the if statement here, we have R5 does not equal 300. All right? And so then we can ask some things about R5 looking at this register, it's kind of a very simple example, but, but perhaps useful, is we can say, is R5 monotonic, meaning it doesn't decide to go increase and then decrease and then go back up or, and you know, so on. And we can say, yes, this is always increasing because it's an add by one. And if there were multiple instructions in there, basically you could walk through that entire expression and go, it's an add by one, it's an add by two, it's a multiply by three. Well, that's always going to be increasing. So we can say it's monotonic. Then the next thing you can say is, well, what is the trip count? Uh, so you want to know how many times you're going to go through this loop. Well, this is a pretty simple case, but it's add by one, and it's comparing it to 300. You can do a little logic on this and say, OK, well, we know the trip count. Good. And there was no memory accesses in this one, so we can say it's memory safe. That's, I'll talk a little bit about memory safety later. Um, another just a quick comment about SCEV folding. SCEV folding refers to, like, um, if we go back here, we see that we have an add by one. But if you were to add by another register, um, there's a process has, called scaffolding, which has a, a bunch of equations on how to handle that. So it's uh, stuff like LLVM has a big table, and you know how to handle two registers being added, or a register being multiplied, or a constant, and so on. And the other thing we always have is if those get too complicated, we just bail out and say we don't know what's going on. So the next trick uh, that didn't pop up in that example, because it was a pretty simple example, was how do we deal with memory safety? Um, what, what the code will do, anytime it sees a read or write into memory, it'll push the entire state of the register stack there. And then once you know the trip count, you can see all of the values of, say, if it's a, if it's a pretty simple index by i, and back in our for loop here, for example, if it was j, I'm not going to jump too far back there, if it was reg5, and we knew that reg5 was accessing a memory, we would know all of the possible indexes into that array. So we could get the bounds from the trip count as well. Um, that was that. Uh, the next trick is that um, we don't just have registers, we also have the stack. So you have to do a um, little extra complicated stuff to push things into and out of the stack. Um, basically, what that means is when you say reg5, you need to know if it's actually a slot on the stack that you're reading or, or not. Yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, first question, uh, if you have a trip count that is odd and you increment by something that is even, yes. uh, how do you handle that? So in the, um, in the not equals here, there's, there's, I just special case the odd even in this case. Um, not equals is sort of an annoying one to deal with, so you have a special case, but the less than and greater than gets much nicer, right? Except if you have overflows. How do you deal with those? So we already have overflow um, precision in, our, in the verifier itself. And basically it says, I don't know what this is anymore. And basically when you get here and you go, oh, what is that, um, what, are the, um, what are the min, max signed or unsigned values? It'll say unknown, and then we just bail out and go, don't know what to do. Um, what else? Um, there, I didn't find any, so we're talking about scav folding again. Um, so there's some really well known operations, like when you add a register to a register, it's pretty well understood how to handle that or multiply registers together. Um, shifts and, and logical operations are a little bit, little bit more tricky. And I don't actually have a solution um, in the code that ran this, so I just sort of skipped over them, which is a hack, obviously. Um, the simple thing to do is just mark them as unknown, except for the LLVM backend for BPF likes to introduce this code right here, the shift shift, um, which is un unfortunate. So we could either teach the backend not to em emit that, which would help, or figure out the right solutions for the skip folding on these different, different types of uh, operations. Um, the next thing is it works fairly well for loops, as long as loops don't get too complicated. Um, I tried more complicated loops than this, and actually the latest BPF backend with LLVM 10 that I pulled actually generated a pretty good code um, for finding induction variables. Like it didn't push them onto the, the stack and off the stack as much as I think like earlier LLVMs did, have done. Um, I don't know if there's any like uh, people that are working on this in the audience, but it seems to have gotten better. Um, I didn't really test it. I just picked some random samples and, and looked through it because I was just, uh, uh, trying to make this work and see what people think. And um, that's it. They can answer questions or jump around. I think one thing is like, this is better than, in some sense right now we just brute force loops. Um, we run them through and then we verify the tournament by running the entire loop. So in this case it's interesting just to look because instead of running the loop 300 times, you run it once. Um, it gets even more interesting if you generate some code that runs a loop multiple times because now that we have the conditions, we can just check on the first trip through. So we don't actually have to do the skip folding multiple times. Once we get back to it, we just check the conditions. If they meet, we can just skip the loop. Um, it gets more interesting, maybe if you could do something with functions, but I haven't explored that much. Right? If you could say this function will always terminate, complete, and is safe if it has these uh, conditions. Um, and those strides would always have to be known constants, right? So you couldn't do it. Uh, they not known constants because you can do the bounds as well. Yeah. Like if there's a min max bound, you can do it. So okay. no known in the sense that they have to be uh, scalars, right? Right. But but not a not an immediate value. Yeah. yeah. But I think this is probably if they're not known. Um, it's a bit tricky. I don't, I, don't know if there, I don't know if there is a solution. If they're not known, I'm not sure if you're going to actually even terminate on, a, on the verifier doing the loop, running the loop right now. So I'm not sure if you can to what happens if I pass in a Fox. stack that counts to a function. So question, what happens if I pass in something like a packet count to a function that does a loop without pass the verifier because the loop counts are known? So, Today, I, b I believe, that, for example, we have a use case where we read, um, read a variable out of the packet, and then that's how we know how many times to run a loop, for example. But then we always bound that by doing, if it's greater than x, if the, trip if the loop counter that you're trying to use for the loop is greater than x, then return, or abort, or continue, or do something. Right? This is how we get around this, because otherwise there's no, if there is no bounds on the loop induction variable, then there's no way to, t to tell if it's going to terminate. You just read an arbitrary uh, byte and try to loop on it. Okay.
In case there were some mechanism to give you that information, because I guess that this is implemented in the kernel, right? Correct, yes. Um, would you benefit from annotations from the compiler? I mean, so the, one of the annotations we have here is, is just telling us where the loops are. Yes. So that's the, like the most basic one. Yeah. Um, like, you know, one thing I played a bit with is can we just annotate what the induction variable is? So like if mm -hmm. they tell us what the loop induction variable is, we could try harder to track that one, for example. Um, you might save like time and memory that way because you wouldn't need the entire table of all the registers, right? Like, so right now it's sort of, it'll track everything because it, the code that I wrote doesn't know what the induction variable is until it gets to the end, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you told it um, kind of ahead of time, we could just track one register perhaps. And other than creating new instructions that obviously it's not going to scale very well, um, what would be the mechanism? So right now we have BTF and they're tied to the instructions. So we could, we could have pulled that out of BTF right there, I believe. I think it would have been fairly painless to do. Um, I just could have instructioned that because it was, I think I, when I, we started playing this, BTF was still in flux. So. Um, and if BTF wouldn't work, I'm sure there's some way we could annotate the instruction from, from the BPF backend side. Okay. Or we could do, yeah, something. Okay, so it would be good if we could stay in touch because in case you need some annotations that we can provide from the compiler and if there is a mechanism to give you that information then we can do that easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alright, thanks a lot. All right, should I start? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Mathieu Denoyer. Um, I'm here to talk to you about uh, my work on the restartable sequence system call. So it's not actually the BPF system call in this case. But uh, I made some experiments using the BPF bytecode uh, and created a prototype, uh, which I uh, called the do on CPU system call. So uh, there might be, I mean, I might not push this upstream uh, because basically we, I've discussed other uh, alternative solutions uh, with Paul Turner this week. So we'll see how it goes. But I think it's worthwhile that I present the results of uh, what I've done here. So what are restartable sequences in a nutshell? A very quick context. Uh, so it is a system call provided to user space so that user, a user space thread can register a thread local uh, storage data entry that will act as an ABI between the kernel and user space. Uh, so the purpose of restartable sequences is to enable user space to implement very efficient per CPU data accesses, uh, including updates. So uh, there are a few reasons for uh, requiring a kind of fallback uh, to restartable sequences. One of them is uh, when trying to update the data of a remote uh, CPU uh, that is aware that works with CPU outplug. So just setting the CPU affinity is not enough because it doesn't work well with CPU outplug. Uh, and in other use cases, so early and late uh, per CPU data use in libc uh, at initialization and in the thread lifetime. And that includes also signal enders nested on top of anywhere in the thread. Um, and another use case is single stepping through restartable sequences with ex pre-existing debuggers. For new debuggers, uh, we, uh, there are modifications we can do to, to the debuggers to teach it about RSEC. But I mean, it might have been nice to have uh, pre-existing debuggers, not turn uh, every program into uh, never-ending uh, busy loops. Uh, so that's the system call <coughs> I did. Uh, <coughs> so it takes as argument uh, basically a BPF bytecode uh, length parameter, and it returns a result. Uh, so it does execute on a targeted CPU received as parameter, and it can have some flags for future extensions. So the requirements of this uh, do on CPU RSEC fallback, so it is not a fast path. 
uh, there can be a very large number of eBPF programs that can exist in user space memory at any given time. Uh, those are fallbacks that might not be used often, but they might be lo loaded in various applications. Uh, so preloading each of them into the kernel and jitting and things like that is impractical with respect to uh, uh, runtime and memory consumption. So, uh, so in this case, what I did is, so they are received as a, param uh, as a parameter from user space to the kernel as a, as a system call parameter for a single use. They execute on a specific CPU that is received as parameter, and they need to, uh, to execute with a preemption disabled uh, critical section so that they can provide exclusive per CPU data access. And the tricky part is, uh, so they are actually dealing with user space memory of the color process, of the color thread. So, uh, so here, I mean, this is the tricky part is uh, they, may, uh, they may need to fault with preemption disabled, and this is a big no-no in the kernel. So I, I looked into the uh, upstream Linux eBPF infrastructure, and I, I found it not really to be a good match for Duon CPU. So it focuses on load store of stack and kernel data. Uh, it calls, uh, so I, uh, the do CPU runtime uh, uh, interpreter also does not need the calls to external functions. Most of the eBPF verifier because it does not touch any kernel data. Uh, the eBPF bytecode to native uh, code JIT, I mean the speed it provides is not really needed since it's a slow path. And also uh, doing this conversion to JIT uh, requires extra memory allocation. So, uh, and the other part, so, so, so what I basically chose for that prototype is to do a very simple interpreter, which does its own bytecode validation. Uh, it interprets the bytecode, uh, uh, so, uh, so it's basically portable. Uh, it does provide loops, loop support. Uh, and uh, so, so the special thing about it so is that it creates a kind of mapping between the user space addresses and a uh, shadow mapping into kernel uh, VMAP memory uh, of wh whatever it needs to access. So it can access them, uh, the data, from preempt of critical sections. So, uh, some, so this is more discussion here. So uh, while doing that and trying to kind of port all the uh, restartable sequences, use cases I had in user space to create the, those bytecode snippet to support them, what I, what I noticed uh, might be needed eventually to add to the eBPF uh, instructions. So first of all, to define a memory model about eBPF. So, I mean, you don't expect when you have, a, let's say, a, I don't know, Java, C Sharp. So when you generate a byte code, uh, you want to generate it in a way that is architecture independent. So that, and then you push to whatever is going to digest the, this byte code and JIT it the task to ensure that the, to enforce the memory model that is defined at the bytecode level in an architecture agnostic way. Uh, and I found there was nothing like this uh, regarding to eBPF. Uh, so some things I would need also is new instructions that are actually based on that memory ordering. So a load acquire instruction, a store release, uh, an actual plain memory barrier instruction. Those do not exist in eBPF. I also found that there were some use cases where part of the interpreter execution did really not require preemption to be disabled. So it was just for a subset of the execution that uh, preemption needed to be disabled. So that, that it might be interesting to eventually support uh, some, some mode where you, when you pass a bytecode, it could come with a flag saying, I want to run with preemption enabled and then add to the eBPF instruction set instructions that could enable and disable preemption for shorter critical sections. Uh, so it could provide much finer grained uh, protection against uh, the scheduler preemption. And one of the goal there is to minimize the scheduler latency impact uh, for preempt RT. Um, yeah, so that's mainly what I have. I do have additional slides that give more detail about handling page faults with preemption disabled and execution mismatch between passes. Um, I guess I have time. Unless there are questions so far. Yeah. Do you have an example when you think a preemptive uh, disable is not needed in your previous slides? You mentioned in some cases. Yeah. So the use case is, 
uh, ring buffer uh, that consists, so it's a per CPU ring buffer. Uh, and uh, how you push, let's say, into that ring buffer would be to mem copy some amount of data, let's say, off a page, right, in directly into the buffer, and then update the offset uh, of product, uh, amount of produced data into that buffer. So all that would be done within a RSEC critical section in user space. And what happens is you can be preempted while doing the mem copy, and uh, as long as you're preempted before storing the actual new value of the offset of how, how, how much has been produced, whatever you copied over is just going to be overwritten. So you don't care about being preempted at that point. So in our sec, it's going to be aborted, and it's just going to be overwritten. So the same thing, the same concept apply if we have that bytecode running at the kernel level. So if it gets preempted, uh, before reaching the update of the, the actual amount of data stored, you don't care, it's going to be overwritten anyway. So all that part can be run with preemption enabled. So, and how I would do, I did not do it, but how I would do the uh, preemption enabled part uh, within the bytecode interpreter would basic, basically to be to add uh, a preempt, uh, preempt required checks uh, uh, in the interpreter, so it would periodically check on the in the thread flags to see if it needs to be preempted, and it will only check that while it is not within a uh, preempt of critical section, an explicit one. So this is mostly for the networking via programs, right? Uh, it's useful for memory allocators, tracing, uh, various things, everything that uses per CPU data, actually. Yeah, for tracing, we have a per CPU data actually will increment before your call detail program, so that probably won't work. For networking program, probably. Some networking program. Can you repeat that? Sorry. No, for tracing, we have this uh, per CPU BPF active counter. Yeah, but uh, I'm doing user space tracing. From user space to user space, no kernel involved. Oh, okay, I see. LTT and GUSD. I see, okay. Other questions? So I, if I do have still some time, uh, I can talk about handling page faults with preemption disabled. So I'd, what I did is a multi-pass scheme. So there's a first pass, which task is to create kernel mappings of memory. So it basically will execute through the bytecode without doing any of the stored side effects to memory. It's going to grab references to each user space page touched by the bytecode. It creates virtual mappings aligned on the same page color as user space pages to ensure that it's uh, uh, coherent on virtually al aliased architectures. And then it, enable, so it enables preemption and restart the bytecode interpretation each time a new page is added to the set. So with this, I do have a data structure mapping between user space memory addresses that need to be accessed by the bytecode and Kernel, ma kernel mappings that can be touched from interop handler context or preemption disabled context. And then the second pass performs store side effects. So uh, the thing is, some alg algorithms want to change data underneath your feet between those two passes. So what can you do against that? So uh, basically, uh, so the fact that you can load an address from user space and then want to either load or store from that address, and this address may change between the two passes. So we need to be able to identify such changes. So I did this by doing a, basically a small tracer. So the interpreter includes a tracer that takes into account every load and store to and from tainted user space memory addresses. So whenever I do a load and a store from a register content, that register content is tagged with a flag that indicates whether that is the result of a value that came from memory uh, or, uh, or a LU operation uh, based on of, uh, such tainted value. And it's the same thing for conditional branches. So if a conditional branch always takes the same direction, we don't care about it. But if the branch uh, depends on registers that are tainted, again, we need to track um, the execution flow and make sure it's the same between the two passes. And then, within the second pass that does the store side effects, if we de discover a discrepancy between the state, it means user space has corrupted the memory underneath our feet. But it may be okay, and it may be part of the algorithm. 
How we define whether it's corruption or it's expected and we just need to retry is whether there has been at least one store side effect observable by user space when we detect this discrepancy. If there's not been any store side effect, we can just restart everything. If there's been at least one, then we need to return to user space that it did corrupt the information underneath our feet and the algorithm is broken. So that's it. Other questions? Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, how much time do we have? Uh, oh, perfect. Uh, okay, before I ask a question, uh, I ask another question. So, and at the beginning, you said you may have a different, completely different approach. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, yep, quickly. Uh, so, here uh, for sim single stepping through debuggers, just ask people to upgrade their debugger with actual RSX support. That might be an alternative option to doing this bytecode interpreter. For the point uh, where we but want actually, actually, this part I didn't quite get when you were talking because you're saying. I don't want to change the debuggers, but you are introducing new system calls, so something in user space still need to change. So which yeah, part is changing? Well, so, so user space applications starting to use RSEC are introducing new code. Mm -hmm. But then the debugger might be a pre-existing tool, right? right? So we have the freedom to uh, talk to the GDB community, and I'm actually going to the New Cauldron this week to actually talk to them, to uh, make RSEC awareness part of the GDB. But so, so then we have a, uh, the question whether people, so what do we do with end users which have newer applications with older GDB? Perhaps the right answer is to ask them to upgrade GDB. Perhaps we want to do something more clever. But if they don't upgrade the GDB, I'm still missing how this new system call helps them. Okay, so the problem with uh, stepping through RSEC, single stepping through a restartable critical section with GDB is that it preempts in between every instruction. Yeah. And the behavior of RSEC when it's preempted, is to abort. And if you don't have uh, an alternative way of executing what you want to do, the way to handle the abort is to retry. So you mm -hmm. are be becoming an endless loop. And yeah, so I know this part, I'm still missing how this system call helps this situation you described. So in the abort case, rather than retrying, you invoke do on CPU. And GDB is not going to single step through do on CPU. I see, okay, that part was missing. How, how does the debugger communicate back to the abort handler that it needs to do this syscall with, because the, the, the BPF instructions would be specific to whatever was interrupted by the debugger, right? The plan with this system call would be to make it part of the application. So the application would implement a, the critical section in assembly and on the abort, it would just call this. Okay, okay, okay. There's a question at the back. Um, so this is very much like single-stepping LLSC atomics on any architectures Correct. with those. But the, only, the difference yeah. is with LLSC, this is a new architecture that the debugger needs to support. So there was no pre-existing oh, debugger just, I mean, that's supporting it. Sure. And pretty much all of those cases, debugger uses horrible heuristics to try and guess where to go to. With yeah. RSEC, we actually have the information as to what to jump to. Um, but also, you have uh, an ability to do something with RSEC that's difficult with LLSC in that your debugger can stop all of the other threads in the application. So if you had a mechanism to suppress RSEC's restart for a period of time, you would be able to single step in one thread while other threads are suspended. Yeah, but will it work with uh, RSEC being used over shared memory across processes? That will not. Yeah. But also um, another problem with this approach of using EPF is that your behavior while debugging is now different to your behavior while not debugging. Because you're in the debugging case, you're always going through the eBPF version of your algorithm, which may not be, like, if, if, you're, if yeah. you have a bug in your application, it's likely that the semantic of the eBPF application is different to the semantic of your assembly sequence. So now you can have an application where whenever you run it through this, it always works. 
and whenever you run it normally, you have a soft bug, bug. That just does not seem great. So how many applications are actually sharing stuff across processes relative to the case where it's just multiple threads within the same process? Uh, so single process seems to be the main use case, a memory allocator stuff and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I care about the shared use case for tracing. So I, I collect information from a shared memory map ring buffer. Uh, so I mean, there are different use cases if it's different people. Because yeah. right? I would su suggest that for the majority of those users, the ability to pause the other threads and single step through the actual assembly sequence is going to be what actually helps them to identify the bug in their application. Mm -hmm. Uh, do we still have time? Uh, one more question. Like, uh, can you uh, forward your slides? Because there, I think you're making as yes, uh, no, uh, even further. Yeah. So this this part, this is just a generic suggestion, right? Yeah. From yeah, side. Yeah. So it's not related to this, like anything. This is just like your uh, feature request in general for for VPF. Yeah, right? and I may not even need them upstream. I was it's just through this experience of working on user yes. space data, I noticed that this so was kind of missing from the instruction set. Absolutely. So like this, the lack of memory model was understood for a while now. Well, at least since uh, December of last year, and we had the. Uh, at least two calls with uh, Paul McKinney, not sure, oh, with Peter. I think you made it, yeah. Uh, and uh, Will, so uh, there was some uh, follow-ups from this that we didn't quite like complete it. So, and in terms of like your list of things, like log, virus, store release, memory barrier, all of this is on to-do list. Understood this is uh, need to happen and memory model, like, yeah, must have. <laughs> Good. Just as well. So. You know, the, my, my point that you're not the first time stepping on this uh, rakes and yeah. The yeah. And the, the last thing I could say is not having a comparison swap was a bit weird if there, since there was an yes. XAD. Yes, that, that, uh, that came at the, at the networking, at the okay. networking conf as well, yes. Yeah. Okay. This is also definitely like something that's missing. There is nothing like architecturally why it's missing. It's just like, well, it was not done. Seems simple as that. And uh, answering this preemption disable stuff, so uh, what we're thinking, it's actually necessary for different other use cases, like for tracing in particular, people want to be able to poke into user memory while tracing. And currently, because preemption disabled, the, the probe read user is missing all of these values, and people do all crazy hacks to, to do this. So we definitely looking for ways to allow faulting from the VPF code and it will be preemptible and not in RCU critical section. So it will be like new program types, only like in system calls where the, it's actually safe to, to fault. But then are there any reasons for disabling preemption in your use cases? Well, that's that's use case, like to fault, to, uh, to be able to access the user space memory. No, we you need faulting. it to be enabled preemption, but why disable it? What's the, what's the reason? Why is it needed? Oh, for all the per CPU accesses and everything. Okay, else. it's for per CPU. Yeah. So locking could be an alternative as well, per CPU locking. Sure. All right, thanks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about kernel runtime security instrumentation. I am KP. I work in the Google Zurich office on detection and response. So before I tell about all of this, uh, it is an LSM that uses eBPF. Everyone is aware of what an LSM is here in the room, I hope so, with the show of hands, I guess. Awesome, OK. There are some. So LSM, I, I, I'll go through that in the uh, presentation as well. But LSM is this framework that allows you to place in certain uh, uh, sections in the kernel. These are called hooks. And you can check whether you're allowed to do so something with the operating system or not. And we want to hook that with the eBPF programs. Why do we want to do that? Well, uh, signals and mitigation in, and these are not Unix signals. These are signals that allow you to detect malicious activity. They go hand in hand. And a signal you can define roughly as something that could correlation, correlate with maliciousness, but it doesn't imply that. And I'm going to give some examples there. You can get these signals from the kernel from stuff like audit. Uh, you can use perf to get those signals. And then once you realize you have enough context based on some signals that you have, 
you want to mitigate stuff. And for mitigation, we have the LSMs. We have SE Linux, AppArmor. You can use SecComp and do mitigation using that. So signal is just correlation, and mitigation is just saying no, don't do it. It's bad. Uh, I, we realized there's something bad about uh, we realized we, we need to get new information from the operating system. We need to add a new signal, as per se. And what do we need to do? We need to update audit. We, let's say we need to update audit to log environment variables. Now, we want to do mitigation based on those new signals that we've added. What do you want to do? You have to update the LSMs. So while they go hand in hand, the process for doing uh, signal and mitigation, it's disjoint in the Linux kernel right now. Um, I'm going to give you more examples of signals here, right? Like, uh, it, it's not really bad, but a process that is executing and deleting its own executable, something fishy is going on. You want to audit log that. A kernel module that gets loaded and it's hiding itself from proc modules. Why would you do that, right? Suspicious environment variables. Setting the LD preload two times on the exact syscall. Why? Uh, hist file size to zero while you execute the command. Something is fishy. Something fishy is going on there. So you just want to audit log that, and then you want to establish a fingerprint, and then you want to mitigate based on that. Some mitigations that uh, uh, that we plan to do, uh, or we could do with this stuff, uh, and we need to, is in data centers. Uh, why do you want to mount USB drives on servers? You might want to have a like a whitelist of stuff that you are allowed to mount, but uh, that sort of dynamic whitelist or dynamic Mac, uh, in the sense, could be configured with the VPF. Again, a uh, whitelist of known kernel, mo kernel modules is something, again, you can configure as a Mac using eBPF on module loads. Uh, also, like preventing known vulnerable binaries from running. Like if you have millions and millions of servers, you have, it's very hard to patch all the binaries or simply delete the executable just because it's, it's vulnerable. So you want, to, you want to know that you want to have extra protections there, and then you, can you may also want to prevent them from uh, running on your production environment. So there are two use cases for Google here. We have our corp environment, which is, which is obviously the Wild West. There's a lot of things that happen. We want to audit log uh, stuff there. And we also have the, uh, uh, the production environment. It's very hard to get through, but like, we also want security and auditing happening there. So how does it work? Uh, we, we said we are an LSM, so it maps to why are we using an LSM? We could use something like SecComp or use like uh, hook system call entry points because sec, uh, LSMs map better to security behaviors. So I'm, when I say security behaviors, what I essentially mean is when I talk to a security analyst, they don't tell me that, look, you know, can you hook up the exact system call on this system, right? They tell me, I want to log this when a process is executed. And that maps really well for, from an LSM perspective. So uh, one, one good thing. It is easy to miss if you're instrumenting system calls because I, this is something I, uh, I a few uh, like or some many years back we missed the exec we add system call, so we were missing out audit logs because it's an API and not the behavior. So it's one of the ways you could do stuff. I also realized when I was developing the LSM, you have user mode helpers in the kernel that would do exec, and definitely not a system call uh, pathway that it would get triggered, but it does go through the LSM hook. The other thing which I feel this could help with is actually benefit the LSM ecosystem because you get feedback from the security community coming in. You ask them what are the actual security hooks you need, uh, and you want these EDPF programs to be simple enough so that security analysts or engineers or whatever you call them, they can write that, and then we get, oh, this place is where we, we need access control, maybe somewhere in the block layer, maybe somewhere somebody wants to protect LBA address ranges there. So there is, there is definitely, we want to get that feedback loop going for the LSM ecosystem as well. Okay. Uh, so on a technical perspective, uh, that's a pretty picture that we show. It, it's, it creates a file in security FS, uh, which is correspond, it has one-to-one -one correlation with a, uh, an LSM hook. It's not the same name because we might realize that some hook is a better map to the behavior. So BPRM check security is mapping to process execution. It could be BPRM set creds or whatever, but you at least want to guarantee the stable API there. But the user, they load the program, typical BPF stuff, do BPF prog load, get two file descriptors. And what KRSI tends to do is it stores this, uh, your, your BPF programs in an array in the den tree of this file that you create. So it's, that's what attachment essentially means. And then you have other LSMs it can be stacked with. It's not a major LSM yet. It could be a major LSM if you know major LSMs have access to these things called security blobs. And currently, 
it's in the work to use like app armor and SC Linux are major LSMs. You can use them, you cannot use them together as, as of now, but KRSI can be stacked with other LSMs at this point. And, and when this PPRM check security is encountered in the kernel, it does, it can say, it can look at user arguments and stuff and say, no, don't do that. What does it look like eventually? So you have that buffer there. That buffer there is the buffer that the, the eBPF program is going to write to. This is your audit logs. Uh, the return value from the eBPF program is essentially like enoperm, don't do that. Uh, that's your enforcement part there. This buffer is currently the perf events buffer. Uh, because we have BPF perf event output, it's quite performant. Uh, and it's a, it's pity that it's called perf because it's not, performance is not its only use case. Uh, and this is one of the questions or discussion topics I have at the end is, is this, I, I saw there were some proposals about making it more generic, but our current, our current plan is to use perf or anything that is there in that space that allows, gives the same performance characteristics. So, and then on the top, you have something that processes your audit logs, uh, like it could, be your, it could be your detection pipeline or some security product that you're building on top, or it could be a small command line that allows you to hook these eBPF programs and actually masks uh, the fact that they're eBPF programs and gives an interface to somebody who is a classical sysadmin and doesn't even want to write eBPF programs. So it's, uh, you can have that there as well. There, there are a few key design principles we want to keep in mind when we're writing this LSM, and that is, these helpers have to be precise and granular, which means that I'm giving an example after this, but you don't want things like VPF Pro Breed because it is exposing too many kernel internals, and if you want security people to write programs that can get useful audit logs or useful mitigations, they will not be able to use these helpers uh, for creating that stuff. As well. It also gives you, uh, you need to start getting accesses to kernel data structures in this case, and deployment on a large scale becomes a huge challenge. So BPF Pro breed, uh, we, we want to avoid that stuff. We use the perf uh, ring buffer. Uh, I'm going to mention one particular thing that we really liked uh, in comparison. There is a bigger talk that we do and we compare all the other alternatives available, but it's, the time span is really short. The, essential benefit to user space here is the format in which you generate these audit logs is controlled by user space. So I have my struct or whatever, right? I use the helpers to fill that information in. I write it to the perf events buffer and I own the life cycle or the format which I'm writing audit logs to, which is very useful. Uh, other things like audit in this case, they have performance impact, yes. They also have uh, limitations on the structure which you get the information back uh, from, uh, from the kernel. So the kernel is not in the business of dictating the format in which these logs are generated. Uh, so that's why we like perf ring buffer. There are some advantages and disadvantages, which are classical software engineering challenges. If you're going to do per CPU stuff, you will need to replicate memory, and then you will have to, uh, on, our, on our initial calculations, this doesn't amount to much, uh, on, uh, even if you have 100 CPUs, uh, and it works, pretty it's, it works pretty well. That's the example I was talking about, the helper design choices. The security analysts tell you that, you know, we want to log environment variables, right? You could write the helper that is get nvars, right? And uh, which is the environment variables can be 32 pages long. I was surprised to see that, but yes, they are. And uh, this is higher coverage, but significant overhead because you have to copy environment variables into a buffer. Basically what Matthew was talking about uh, for user page faults, you cannot, you cannot preempt eBPF programs. Uh, but you could also have a more precise helper in this case, which is get me the environment, uh, get me the value of LD preload, that, because that's what I'm interested in, or get me the value of hist file size or whatever. So you start thinking about the actual information you need rather than dumping everything and generating a lot of overhead on your pipeline and on your user space and the system in general. So that's a rough case study of how we want to go about designing helpers. Yes, somebody has a question. <laughs> Yes. Uh, but if you have preemption disabled while calling the helper, it does not help you. I, I'm going to talk about how okay. we go around that. Uh, Alexa said that we have people come up with weird hacks to, or, or I would say optimizations, but let's, uh, <laughs> I'm going to explain what kind of optimizations we came up with this. So yeah, these poor programs cannot sleep or run and they cannot, they cannot be preempted. So the LSM hook does some pre-computation, uh, BPRM check security. You get those in uh, arc pages. You get call. You get user pages remote. It, 
LSM hook is not, uh, uh, it's not afflicted by the same thing as the eBPF is. So when the LSM hook, uh, when you reach the LSM hook, you copy all the environment variables into, the, into, the, into a buffer, and you pass it to the eBPF context in that as a pointer. And yeah, like, and you can, we add another optimization, we check whether this call to the, whether a call to this helper actually exists in the eBPF program, so that not all programs are afflicted with, the, with this copy of the buffer. And the exact system call is not typically the most performant system calls anyways, because I realized when I was running uh, on a, in a VM versus like when I was running on a large server that this was very minimal impact. The, again, there is, we pr pr publish performance data with comparison to audit. Uh, it's not an apples to apples comparison because audit doesn't even log environment variables, but uh, with the same amount of information, we were able to get a relatively tight distribution for latency, even in the exact syscall pathway. And uh, it, and also we could do these optimizations for anything that was not needed in the, when you no, don't enable auditing there. So the the, the there are some questions we, we posted the patch set uh, on the list, and there are some questions that we want to have. Uh, we have a single program type uh, BPF Pro type KRSI, so that's uh, and there is a single attachment type. We don't want to complicate all of that stuff uh, and. Uh, since we want other and the analysts or security people to write programs, uh, so that's one thing that is up for discussion. The perf events buffer stuff is up for discussion, and yeah, that's pretty much it from my from my talk. <laughs> Questions? Uh, first, uh, comments about a uh, perf ring buffer. Yeah, and uh, you can have a per CPU perf ring buffer. Yeah. So that way you do not waste the memory, memory on other CPUs. You just need to ping your user space process to a particular CPU. That should work. Okay. You get buffer. Okay. You know, you. The second is, uh, uh, you have uh, how many attach points do you have? All the attach points for general SSM? Sorry? How many, uh, basically, you mentioned a few attach points, right? Yeah. And how many, I mean, I just. The, all, the LSM hook, uh, yes. if there is an LSM hook and if you want to get data back from the LSM hook, uh -huh. uh, you, you will create a file in the security FS. There okay. is a single attach type, but you can get the file descriptor from the security see. FS back. You get the program file descriptor and then you attach the program. Uh, you store it in the, basically in the dentry for that. I see, so essentially mm -hmm. the programmable, like LSM. LSM yeah, exactly, module. yes, exactly, okay. yeah. Any more questions? Yes. So with the approaches you proposed there, I mean, you kind of need to know in advance what you will touch within the program before you start the program. So what, what would you do if you need the program computation to identify the actual pages you're going to touch? So, so what happens is we know that, we know this KRSI get NVAR helper needs to have access to the argument pages, right? So you call get user, get art pages, you know that there's a function call in there's a call to this helper, and only if there's a call to the helper, you would get the pages back. Uh, you would get these specific pages back. Okay, so it's a specific solution for a specific problem. Exactly, it's, it's, not, not, it's, a not, it's not generically solving the sleeping eBPF problem for sure. And when Alexa tells me that it's going to be happening anytime, uh, it's going to be happening soon, that comforts me, and I can get rid of all of that code. And when you say pin the pages, is it just a get user page? It get get user pages because get user pages has a very weird like you you have to uh, you you're pointed to the top of the stack there and then you you can you need to do weird pointer arithmetic. I I spend time doing that rather than doing all of that in the hooks context. You can do that in the LSM. Yeah. yeah. So so I did play with that a little bit. The problem there, I think, it does not guarantee that it's within the page table. It guarantees the existence of the page. So if after that within the interpreter you're actually trying to get through you the page we table. copy all of that we copy all of that into kernel memory. okay yeah. copy. because the, the, otherwise otherwise we cannot guarantee anything we, we you could still trigger a page fault right like you yeah yep. that's no uh, uh, just trying to understand how this mechanism works so this is patch eleven. And uh, you're doing this num uh, number of pages. So how do you know how many pages? So this part I'm still missing. So oh, no pages to copy. You, the, if you have like, so like you know, you know the num arc pages, yeah. it's there in the Linux BPRM struct. Uh, and the Linux BPRM struct has a pointer to the top of the first page that the argument is located. It also has uh, uh, you you start iterating on the arc C and arc V. Uh, oh, okay. So yeah. it's, so it comes from the actual process. Well, but then. Yeah. If the process is huge, 
it can on purpose have uh, well a gigabyte of uh, LDP well of args of argv and yeah. now you'll just like copy the gigabyte of memory sure like so that's yeah. security Case issue <laughs> it's not as bounded by the the stack size so your stack r limit will limit that but if you have a giant stack r limit um, it'll be bounded yeah. but there are not completely insane stack limits and the all those things will be contained within the stack uh, and when when it was first exact so it's it's not as bad as you think but it is potentially still very big <laughs> Uh, I mean, yes, this is this is a this is the use case. But what we want to also do in the helper choice there is right, like if the environment. So let's say you set LD preload to uh, a gig uh, large variable, right? You leave the choice onto the user space. You leave the choice to them that what do you want to do in this case? Do you want to reserve a buffer that is so large uh, and then and get the audit data out, or you want to mark that as an overflow and then log the overflow as an audit log? Because that's also a signal. If someone is trying to do that an LD preload with a gig size. That is, a, that, is, that is actually a very malicious behavior that you want to audit, and you may want to deny that from your EVPF program itself. So th that's one option you have. Uh, there's one thing I, I, I wanted to mention is in the context, uh, there, the, there's the BPF context. We don't allow any reads into the context from the program. It's essentially like a token that you pass to your helper because uh, first issue is ease of use. Like we don't want the people who are using the helpers. That we want them to use it as an API rather than playing with the con and also helps in keeping uh, in uh, in uh, helps us as the maintainers for KSI to add and change things in the context without worrying about breaking user space. So uh, it is essentially a token that you pass to helper and get data back from it. You don't have the verifier just says if you access anything from the memory, it just says no. For now, it's a conservative start to something we might revisit later on, but we don't want to open open that can of worms to the user space right now. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
And the second one is like uh, programmable. Like uh, each key, we can have a BPF program and try to tell you what to do about this key. And uh, for example, you say delete, and uh, you can say uh, look up, you can say delete and look up. So this kind of like give you action for each key value pair. So both uh, approaches and we need to make sure, and uh, especially if, uh, in the BPF hash table, and uh, it has a bucket and it's possible when you try to get next key, and actually the key you try to start is deleted. At this point, you lose the information and where is the next key. And the current implementation, we say, okay, we just go to the first key. And uh, if this happens, you could say from the first one, go to second one, and you suddenly lose track and you go to first one again. Second, third, go to 100 and lose track again, you go to the first. So it's kind of bad. So we need, a, we need to have a back, better mechanism in kernel and uh, simply just go through each key and uh, if we delete it, we do something. And uh, so ne now let come to the next slides. Uh, we propose to do a bucket-based iteration. And uh, Alexei mentioned this uh, in one of the uh, upstream emails. And uh, the user, user space, and the, the, the goal is the user space request does not based on keys. It's based on some kind of opaque number, like a batch ID. And uh, internally, this batch ID and uh, map to some kind of the buckets in kernel. And uh, this, uh, uh, and uh, in kernel for each batch, and we will first lock, take a lock for this batch, and then we do the operation, and after operation is done, we do unlock. So this is uh, actually pretty simple. Idea is pretty simple. And uh, uh, like uh, uh, Java and uh, Foley, uh, the concurrent hash map has a similar mechanism. So this is kind of like a standard way. Uh, question, Angie. What do you do if you have multiple elements in single bucket? Uh, multiple single element in a single bucket, you process as a batch. You process it all together. What if the values are too big to output to the user space? Exactly. In this case, and we will return to user space, say, error code like uh, not enough space. And then user space need to restart from that batch, increase, for, for example, double their buffer to the kernel. Okay. And in worst case, user space already know what the maximum element is. For example, for a particular map, you need to provide the max element, you just cover the whole thing. It will guarantee. But user space doesn't know how many hash collisions there are, right? No, it does not. But I actually have a question to a previous slide as well. Like, where this uh, requirement of no dupli actual previous one, uh, requirement to have no duplication in lookup, does it mean like we should not return the same key twice? Yes, something confused Why? to user space. And you but it's very easy to filter, actually. No? Well, it's uh, not easy, actually. Sometimes uh, if you go back repeatedly, and then you may get new keys, and because it's so dynamic, right? And something may delete, new, add new things, and uh, you could, but you could say, I, I delete this one, I update this one, and then you say, I remove this one, some key may not be counted this way. But if it's update, you will have like previous value and new value. So like if you see that the value changes, you the, can just the key, just the key yeah. might have been deleted, might have been gone for a while, and then might be re-added from exactly. a different That's thread what in I the mean. system. And yeah. it might be the same. The key and the value might be the same now, but it might be at, at a different point in the linked list inside of the bucket. But so won't you have the same situation with just bucket ID? Like you like one time you look up bucket zero, and then like. If you have multiple, ah, oh, we will return error if like we the, can't. The bucket ID will make forward progress. It never go backward. It may be stuck in a particular bucket, they say not enough space, and the user need to increase, I mean, the buffer size. You will try. If it succeed, go to the next one. It never go back. Okay. And this is a simple, I mean, the, your API and you just have a batch, have input and output, have some keys, values, buffer, and have a count. This count is uh, 
input is provided a size of the buffer, and the output will be something like uh, how many succeeded. The user can get a sense. And the other is the map FD and the map flex. And this is a programmable uh, batch processing and proposed by Jacob. Unfortunately, he is not here. And uh, so uh, the idea is for each map, and uh, we kind of like have a context, which is a key value pair. And then you fit into a BPF program. And this BPF program will run and tell you what action for this basically map, key and value pair. And then you can say, OK, uh, if it's a delete, it will go to another thing. And otherwise, uh, it, it probably do some action and in, in, the, in the BPL program itself. And uh, it do a synchronized RCU, and then it will, before the old deleted key, it will go ahead and delete. But it give you an option and uh, try to do something of that, something about this key value pair and uh, before you delete it. So this is a, a kind of like a programmable, much more flexible and uh, well, that's uh, just another option. I, I think, think what is that's the last slide. So now up to discussion. What do you think? I, mean? I what think what is um, interesting on the last approach. Um, yeah. One example might be some sort of I don't know garbage collector. So you could compare timestamps already in your BPF program, and then you can say, okay, I'm deleting this element right away, because right now you sort of have to do the lookup, and then. Potentially, that could be a race, right? Because when, then, when, you, when you then say, I'm going to delete it in the next system call, it could already be gone and it could already be a new element, but that's not what you actually want to delete. So that might help in that case, at least. Yeah. Race C is always a tricky. I mean, it's uh, the, the correct semantics is hard to define. I mean, because you could race a little bit earlier, do this, or after that a little bit, and then it's, it's really tricky. Yeah, uh, so for the programmable approach, like if you just want to dump all the elements, like what will you do? You will set up the perf buffer and will perf event output all the values? Uh, in this case, yes. And uh, we will have uh, uh, the program itself and it will return to dump it to a perf ring buffer. Yes. But then, so like with perf buffer approach, like the problem is that you don't have a, like a flow control essentially, right? Like you will run the BPF program as fast as possible for every element and user space might not be able to consume all the elements. So you will be missing elements without knowing that, right? Perf ring buffer. So how would you dump a big table? Like you will either have to pre-allocate huge perf buffer or you will lose elements, right? This is the same problem and you can, you, you, you dump and then the, I think the um, ring buffer, I don't know whether Peter can correct me, and I think it will block, right? And if you, no, the kernel, no, no, no. it will not block. There's, oh, a, okay. there's a flag at least, right? You'll know that you lost, lost things. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, so th there are of course like issues, yeah, if the ring buffer is too small, like obviously. Uh, uh, but uh, where this type of stuff, I think we will need regardless, is uh, I think uh, in a network track it came up that it would be good to have some sort of uh, notification for the callback for all you expiring. So this pretty much is the same mechanism. So from very different use cases, batching, LRU updates, or like different zones in LRU, like all of this potentially is implementable with this new type of BPF programs that are acting on map elements. For LRU, potentially they can be called when decides to delete stuff and the program can actually see well whether this is zone or not and do this uh, zone stuff that you you wanted for different review things right and we already know how to attach programs to maps so with touch with this and attaching programs to maps we have a lot of infrastructure to do it question um, considering that uh, the eBPF context runs with preemption disabled, I'm not sure I understand how the synchronized RCU is supposed to actually work. Because you cannot synchronize RCU while preemption is off. I'm pretty sure of that. Then we just remove it. <laughs> <laughs> this is what. Uh, uh, this, this may so not be preemption so disabled. So you run through all of this, then, then do things. Like this is. This is not during the program run. Oh, this is not BPF. Okay. So, oh, that's called BPF run. Yeah. The program the, has the preempt around the actual BPF run. Okay. So, 
Yeah, this is the outside, and uh, prime run is the inside, and this is does not prime by itself. Basically, it just goes through the maps. So, uh, maybe still the question is about we 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 go through the regular rotating. We worry about losing the the next key because if you have your next key, your next key is deleted. But can we solve it by like if you have an open FD for this? Uh, Attached to the SD, you have a pointer to the next uh, to the next uh, key. So if next key was deleted, we will update that. So you go back to that pointer for your next key is already updated when you get it, when the previous next was deleted. But all this could be deleted. I mean, a lot could be deleted before and after. Right? I mean, if you get something before this key, that's like that's kind of by design. You do not you skip it, right? We worry about it. you have to go back, but if you delete, you don't have to go back to the first one. So <coughs> yes. So essentially, well, what rough, what you're proposing is roughly what is implemented user space for exactly the same use case for concurrent like update lookup and walks of the hash table, and user space is doing it with the. Uh, uh, hazard pointers, which is exactly sort of what you're saying. If you know that this is what you will be deleting and it is being deleted, the the walk still preserves the element because it's walking it. Oh. And this is sort of like alternative to our CU reclamation, but in kernel we don't have hazard pointers yet. Um, no, I, don't, I mean, when you delete it, the user space doesn't know it gets deleted, right? No. But in kernel, when that gets deleted, we could also say before we delete it, get the next and save the next to, well, it's not that. What if yeah. both next is deleted as well? Yeah, How it's like the atomic will be tricky if, if ever possible. I'm not sure whether it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't we just move to the next bucket in case the previous element is not found? Because we are inconsistent anyway, like uh, even with the batch uh, approach, uh, if someone add elements to a bucket that we already traverse, we are going to miss elements anyway. So that always happens. So if we know in which direction we are going, that in this case, if we are dumping the entire map, we already know that we want to finish. So we want, we want to keep moving. So just move to the next bucket and Provide me the next key that you can actually retrieve. Yeah, basically, in extreme case, it just everything is in one bucket. You didn't give user a chance to dump, right? You just say, move to the next one, next one has nothing. So, so, so a common dump. problem you, you I've seen is that when you, when you fetch and then you delete, there's a chance that stuff changed between when you fetched it and read it and when you delete it. And what you really want to do is you want to fetch and delete it as an atomic operation. So that you're deleting what you read and got in user space. You know, it was some event, it was some byte counter or something, and you want to make sure that you deleted what you yeah, acted on. Say, yeah, so you basically want easy. like fetch this, mm -hmm. delete this, and return me something so that when I call this again, I can get whatever is the next element. Yeah. And since you're fetching and deleting, you're effectively always pulling out the first element from a bucket. So the next element is just that same bucket again, and then if you call it and it's empty, you move on to the next one and until you find whatever is the next one that has something. Yeah, yeah it's kind of like that. Although there's uh, uh, some difference is if you uh, always the first go through here and suddenly it's gone, you go back, somebody insert a lot of C before that, you start to delete them. It's a little bit difference. But you uh, People are simply looking for something like a database crusher. So we simply say, look up key and table, put crusher at this point, and then look up delete from multiple keys at once. Would that work? Let me go, go back to key the list. I think that's <laughs> what the proposal is to do this multiple keys at once. So uh, to answer uh, uh, Moshe's point, so. Uh, we have, we, in the current hash table implementation, we use uh, a link list, uh, walk link list nulls. And why are we doing this null stuff? Because there they can be cases where you start walking the link list, and in this bucket, you have a key that like 
completely somewhere out. Like it could be before, it could be after. So like if you, it may, may not be related even to like deleting the element, just by walking the bucket, you potentially have races getting the elements. So you can start in one bucket, walk in the next list and finish but actually right, with a different bucket. But you start again at the, you start again at the previous That's structure. why we start again. For the, for the simple lookup, that's why that's how it works. That's how this whole null stuff works. We're walking the thing and like if we found the null value that actually guard value, it shows the bucket number, it's in a different bucket, we restart the whole thing. Where with dumping, we kind of dumping it along the way. So either we like walk the whole thing pre-allocated for the dump because we have this reiterate stuff. So it's not. So I, th I think if I could basically call into the kernel say me, saying, give me a hundred elements with the key and values and delete them at the same time and then kind of tell me where, where that ended, I could, that would give me the batching and it would, it, I don't think it would be race free because you're deleting it in the kernel. So by definition, you're, you, you don't need to be walking linked lists. You're always deleting from the front, right? Uh, not really. Mm. Uh, you, you delete it from front and uh, suppose you are in a bucket zero and uh, come to bucket one starting to delete and you're starting delete and somebody fill in bucket zero. No, no, but that, there's no problem if someone is adding and oh, removing you go back stuff to from an earlier that. bucket. So yes. long as I don't ever return to the earlier bucket, right? In this case, it will return if you keep deleted. Now, now it's true that there may be so many insertions yeah, happening yeah. that yeah, I yeah. never successfully empty a bucket and move yeah. on to the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but, but imagine you have a bucket, right? Like 10 elements and, and you say like delete, well, look up and delete five elements, right? Right. You have to restart from the same bucket. I right? have to restart from the so same bucket. So if you yeah. restart with, always restart with the same bucket, then you can get duplications because if you didn't that, do that, That's okay. So, so that's what okay. I was asking, like, so is it okay to return so duplicates? No, no. Duplications are okay. Guys, I, I think we need, to, we, need, we need to table this discussion. <laughs> I don't think we'll resolve it. <laughs> <laughs> right now, and we're out of time, and we have a strict deadline. Uh, thank you, Johan. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming. It was an awesome uh, VPF microconference. Thank you, uh, all the presenters and uh, all the attendees. So uh, your presence uh, made a big difference. This is applause to you.